reminders as we, before we get started. It's courtesy to your fellow media members, the coaches and the student athletes, kindly ask you to silence your cell phones. We ask that you please provide your name and affiliation when asking a question. We'll have two or three people with microphones. I'll try to you know, make, uh, make eye contact with me or, or raise your hand or give me a signal that you have a question and then I'll try I to get the microphone holder over to you. Um, the recording video of these press conferences is prohibited. We ask you to use the uh, digital me NCA Digital Media Hub or the electronic media boxes in the video workroom. You are, however, still allowed to take still photos. And then again, I'll give these to you later. The satellite coordinates for the high definition feeds of all press conferences are posted in the media workroom as opposed to me reading all these numbers. If you have any issues finding them, please just see me or one of the members of the media coordination team and we can help you with those satellite coordinates. And then today is separate press conferences for each team's coach and then the student athletes for a duration of approximately 15 minutes. We'll probably won't go any longer. We can't go any longer than 15 minutes. Um, and then for those of us, those of you joining us on Zoom, uh, we will get the questions in the room first and then we will look for anyone that's raising their hands on Zoom and we will try to get, get your question in too. Sure you're here. Morning, everyone. Welcome to the NCAA Division I Men's Basketball Regional Semifinals in Philadelphia. Today is the practice day press conference for St. Peter's University. Joining us now is head coach Shaheen Holloway. Welcome to Philadelphia, and you're welcome to make an opening statement. Otherwise, we'll go right to questions. Let's go right to the questions. One of the comments I think you made, um, I think after the second round, you talk about the toughness of the kids being from Jersey and all this <laughs> other stuff, which is probably true. But my question to you is, is that, is that the kind of makeup of kid you're looking for with this program? And how much of your experiences you play, you've been through this before as a player, how much uh, of, of those experiences as a player that you bring to the table in coaching these guys up and helping them to be familiar with how to get through this kind of a situation. Yeah, you know what? Um, yeah, I, I made that comment. Uh, I, was, I was answering a question that was asked. Um, but yeah, typically those are the type of kids I like to recruit. You know, guys that are under-recruited, you know, have a chip on their shoulder with something to prove. Um, 
tough, hard-nosed kids, tough-minded. You know, I'm a coach that really get after my guys, so you got to be a tough kid and tough-minded to play for me. Um, and as far as my experience in the tournament, I just try to share a little bit with them, but not too much because I, I wanted it to be about them, not about me. Um, just, you know, enjoy the ride, you know, understand who we are and where we are, and continue to keep working hard. Felix from Hot Post. Uh, obviously, this Cinderella run has lifted the spirits of an entire nation. But can you talk about how it has provided a sense of community, togetherness, and support, specifically in Jersey City? And have you and your team have experienced it? No, it's been great. You know, um, I don't, not just Jersey City, just in general, right? With the last two years with COVID and everything been so down and so dark, um, right now just a time where, you know, especially in Jersey City and New Jersey, um, the, everybody's rallied around us. It's been tremendous. I mean, the support has been unbelievable. Um, and that's just something that, you know, even before um, the pandemic, you know, St. Peter's, when I got there, I made sure that we did a lot in the community. That's important to me. Um, but even now, like the send off we had last night to come down here, we had about, I would say, 500 people there just to send us off. It, it, it was unbelievable. This goes third row. Right here, right there. Thank you. And then pass it over. Yeah, Steve Edelson, Gannett, New Jersey. Hey, Shaw. How are you doing, Steve? Um, what is the biggest differences between the team that was 12 and 11 in this team right now? The only difference is I would say is uh, everybody is more confident now. You know, before we was we had, we had a lot of guys that wasn't sure their roles on the team. Um, a lot of guys that was still trying to find themselves and you know get back in shape and stuff like that. You know, I, I tell the story that the co the COVID pause actually helped us. You know. Mm -hmm. I know it uh, messed a couple teams up, but it actually helped us. It got, it got us a chance. We didn't play in 28 days, something like that. So you got a chance to have like a mini a mini, uh, mini camp to get you know ready and get get back. And since the COVID pause, this team has been a different team because they understand we kind of been locked in, you know, and followed the goal. And the goal was always be a defensive first team. Early on, we were trying to do some things that we couldn't do, but we kind of got a chance to get back focused. Um, my uh, Coley Harvey, ESPN. I'm curious. Uh, I'm doing well. I'm curious uh, about just the way this week has gone for you guys. You guys, you know, no one was really paying attention to you nationally, so to speak. There's been a little bit of a fame that's been attached to some of the players the last couple of days. How have they managed that with also trying to prepare for this game? You know, it's, it's funny. It's a thin line, right? Um, these guys work their butt off to get to this point, you know, and I, and I want these guys to get the attention that they're getting because it's good. But it's also a distraction, you know. Um, so Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, I let, you know, the media and everybody and the guys kind of do it. After yesterday, we kind of shut it down just to get back focused, understand that the task at hand, you know, we got to take care, try to take care of business Friday night. Um, but you know what? It's, this group is good. You know, this group is, is, is older. You know, I got, I got an older group. So the older guys understand, you know, what's at hand, and, and, and they kind of help the younger guys with it. Uh, a lot of this team has been re Purdue team has been referred to as a sort of a Noah's Ark type of team. You know, two of every a Noah's, uh, a Noah's Ark type of team. They got two of everything. Uh, when you were trying to prepare for them with so much to try to take away, is there anything you've been tried to maybe focus on more than others in regards to just being the mandatory requirement to do well tomorrow night? You trying to get a scout report for them? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> now you know what? Uh, no, nah, Purdue is a great team. Very well coached. Um, great players. No, it's, it's hard, man. You got to pick and choose your, you know, your poison. You know, they got two very good big guys down low. They got great guards. You just got to kind of do what you do, kind of make some adjustments, some tweaks um, without trying to give up too much. But, you know, um, just go out there and play basketball, man. Just do what we've been doing the whole year. And, uh, like, we're we going to have a good scout report in place for them. Josh? Shaheen, Josh Verlin, City of Basketball Love. You got two guys in the program, uh, Clarence and Ryan, with strong ties to Philadelphia. What sense have you gotten – that this game means to them uh, playing it here in, in the city that they're from. Who was the second guy? Ryan Whalen. <coughs> Ryan's from Jersey. He went to St. Joe's. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? Uh, no, Clarence, you know, for Clarence coming back home, it's, it's tremendous for him, man. He's, uh, he's, he's super excited. He's super happy. I'm happy for him. As far as Ryan, you know, Ryan, Ryan is Ryan. Ryan hasn't slept in two weeks. You know, Ryan's been doing all the, all the, all the scouts. Um, 
you know, he's right now just mentally out of it. So he's like a zombie. You know, um, but he's, you know, he's excited to, to be back. And I know he's a St. Joe's guy. But, um, you know, right now, we really not really think about all that. We just kind of think about trying to see what we could do with Purdue on Friday. Jaden Daly, <coughs> Jaden Daly, Daly Dose of Hoops. Shav, you spoke of your vision with this team and where you ultimately saw it. Can you just get us caught up to speed on how the journey's taken shape over the last three years and what it's led to at this moment? No, it's been great. You know, I'll be honest with you, it's been great. You know, I got a lot of support at, at St. Peter's. You know, the administration has been unbelievable. Um, and as far as the players, like, when you bring a group of guys in, that kind of fit you and fit your personality and know what you want. You know, I've been very lucky to have, you know, a group of guys that are not just great on the court, like they're great in the classroom, they're great in the community. And when you got guys like that, it makes it very easy. Um, so I'm just, you know, I'm the head of the snake. I'm here, I'm, you know, I'm in practice, I'm this and that, but these guys are carrying the mission out to a T. You know, they don't get, I don't think they get enough credit for what they're doing or what they did. Middle blue shirt, the mask on. Zach Braziller, New York Post. Shad, no, no 15 seed has ever gotten to the Elite Eight. You know, you guys are the first New York area team to even get to this point in 22 years. Can you just put into context what Friday night means? <laughs> No, it means everything, Zach. You know, uh, like it's, it's funny. Everybody keeps talking about you know my team that played 22 years ago. Wow, jeez, I'm old. Like I'm we older was together. Than you. She's my SID then. We was together. How about that? Um, you know, it, it's it's great, Zach. You know, it's you know, it, like you try not to think about that, right? I try not to put that kind of pressure on the team, right? We just try to take it one game at a time, but. If that could happen, it'd be tremendous. I mean, unbelievable, not just for New Jersey, like just for the Tri-State area, period. To have a team representing an Elite Eight is something that, you know, you think about doing as a coach, right? It's hard to get to this point. So when you're here, you just got to continue to keep working and try to get further and further. Got one in the back, microphone. Adam Kilgore with the Washington Post. Um, you mentioned the other day that uh, you had a kid you weren't going to try to use in practice to try to mimic what uh, Zach Eady does for Purdue. What it didn't happen. <laughs> it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't happen. I tried. Was I tried that two of them. It didn't happen. <laughs> was that Jerry that, that you tried with? Yeah, I would try to do it with Jerry. You know, he's you no know, Jerry's good. You know, but you know, big fella from Purdue. He, he's a different animal. Excuse me, a different player. We passed to, to Dan Gelston. How you doing, Dan, Dan Gelson, the Associated Press. Has Doug been sharing his chicken wings with everybody yet, now that he has the uh, NIL deal? Man, you know what? It's, it's funny, you know, Doug and I had a conversation about that yesterday. Everybody was, everybody's tummy was hurting yesterday, so I, I know why now. <laughs> it's from the chicken wings. I'm just curious, um, you know, you, you've had a quote of yours on a billboard already. He's, he's getting kind of his 15 minutes of fame with, with the NIL deal and the mustache as a Twitter account. What are some of the, I guess, other maybe wilder things you've seen this week, and is there anything that's really st stood out among the extraordinary uh, images of the week? You know, I, I try to keep it simple and for our guys. I, I didn't want it to get too crazy and too big. Obviously, you know, with the media attention, it, it's, it's good and bad, right? Um, but this team, like I said, they've been good. You know, they haven't been worried about too much. You can't keep them on social media, so obviously, you know, they're reading a lot of things. But for the most part, I haven't seen a difference in them. These guys just been level-headed, kind of even quilt, so just kind of keep it that way. Shaheen, Jerry Carino from Gannett, New Jersey. Uh, what is the message that your players send to every under-recruited, underrated kid who has big dreams? Just keep working. Keep believing in yourself. You know, understand it's a process. Um, things not gonna happen overnight, right? You gotta go to a place that best fits you and do what, what you do, trying to do. Not worry about the name in front of New Jersey, right? Kind of just worry about the good, the opportunity that you have. Um, and for us, and that's what this, that's why I really like this group. You know, they came in, they believe in my vision. Think about it, you know, when the last time a, a group, somebody played 12 guys double figure minutes? You know, I've been trying to do that since my first year. And people said that you can't do that, you can't do that. And now I see everybody's doing it now. You know, all the teams that's winning have 10 guys playing double figure minutes. Um, so just believe in yourself, kind of go a place that fit what you're trying to do and anything is possible. 
We're going to try to take one or two questions from the Zoom room. Mark Erne. Go ahead, Mark. Thanks. Uh, Coach, you talked about how your guys have been dealing with the distractions uh, earlier this week. Obviously, there's a lot uh, of news about you and what may lie ahead. How have you been able to block out all of the extra noise the last few days? Yeah, I don't, I don't worry about stuff like that. I don't, I don't deal with rumors. I don't deal with all that type of stuff. I just kind of focus on the task at hand. The task at hand is try to, you know, be the good Purdue team on Friday night. And that's been my focus ever since last, last Saturday night. We'll go one more in the Zoom room, Daryl Johnson. Go ahead, Daryl. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, you talked about, you know, your makeup and the makeup of, of the team being, uh, making them built for this moment. Can you give us some examples of something you've gone through, something one of your players has gone through that, that made you ready for this moment? Well, I don't make this about me. This is about the players. If you, if you look at our track record since I've been here, um, our non-conference schedule has kind of been built around that. You know, my first year we played at uh, Auburn, South Carolina, North, North Carolina State, Clemson. Then the second year we played at UConn, Providence, St. John's, Maryland. Uh, this year, obviously, St. John's, Maryland. So I kind of, you know, have these guys ready to play against big-time teams. So these guys, that's why I don't think these guys are intimidated by anybody. Because these guys just go out and play basketball and have fun. We are out of time. I know you're not sad about that. But. <laughs> so we are going to dismiss Coach Holloway, and then we will bring in the St. Peter's student athletes. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good luck tomorrow. Again, a reminder, try to also make eye contact with our microphone holders. Yes. Okay, I think we're ready. Thanks, Dan. Yep, thank you. Again, please state your affiliation for asking the question, and we'll get as many as we can in the room and then try to get to Zoom as time allows. This is the practice day press conference for St. Peter's University. Joining us are student athletes Daryl Banks III, Bassini Drame, Casey Nadefu, Hassan Drame, Matthew Lee, and Doug Edder. What we'll do right now is that we're going to just start with questions. So again, identify yourself after um, you receive the microphone. Start over here. And please address, if you're going to address a student athlete, Please go directly to them. Uh, Austin Petalolo, Trend the Philly Hoops. This could be for any one of you guys, but Shaheen always talks about being Nor North Jersey tough, New York tough. What does that look like? Let's start. Hassan, do you want to start us off? Hey, hey guys. Uh, well, Coach always talk about Jersey and New York toughness. Uh, he will mean that. For those who are familiar with New York and Jersey basketball, you always know one thing about them, they will never back down no matter what the challenge is because they were born and when they were growing up playing basketball, they always learn how to challenge when they're playing. We'll go to Daryl. Uh, yeah, so it's just, uh, being on this coast, being on 
in New York and New Jersey, you have a different type of toughness, a different type of swag with you when playing a game of basketball. Um, it's always like a chip on your shoulder, really. It's just, it's just a different breed of basketball, and that's what all of us embrace when we play. Question. Chris Murray, Philadelphia Sunday Sun. Um, my question to you guys, and Coach talked about the uh, that, that chip that you guys have on your shoulders and whatnot. Was that something that you, that, that you guys carried with you in these first two rounds? No one gave you a chance to be obviously Kentucky and all that, and then, and then you'd be a, a really good Murray State team. So I was just wondering how much did the, the, does that fuel you guys throughout your practices? How much do you think about that, the fact that you're in this moment now? Well, uh, I feel like we've had that all year round. You know, this is who we are, and um, just being able to be on the big stage and finally show that uh, this is what we do and, you know, this toughness and chip on our shoulder is what we bring to the table. And uh, definitely in practice, you know, coach thrives on and uh, shows us that we should bring that passion and that uh, determination to the game and towards practice every day. Yeah. Sure. Um, Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I think uh, that everybody on our team has a chip on their shoulder, uh, especially our coach too. We're all looking to prove ourselves, uh, prove ourselves as a, as a program, um, as a basketball team. And uh, it, it starts in practice. Everyone's trying to compete against each other so we can be able to uh, execute the game plan for whatever game we're, we're about to play. And uh, up until recently, uh, the chip on our shoulder is just getting bigger and bigger. We're still trying to prove ourselves. We're not satisfied with anything right now. And uh, we're going to continue to keep that going. Jerry. Jerry Carino, Gannett, New Jersey. Guys, what, what is the message to every kid out there who's underrated, under-recruited, but has big dreams to be on a stage like this? One of you want to start? Hassan or Doug? Um, well, my message to, to any kid that's, that's being under-recruited and, and considered underdog is just to keep putting in hard work. Hard work uh, always prevails. The cream always rises to the top. So as long as you, you keep working hard and putting on put it in your work, you're gonna be good. Uh, <laughs> my message to those kids is no matter what, like I, I always say, is about timing. Time will always tell. The time that you're working, never expect something. People opinion is their opinion. Opinion is a form of judgment. So you can never ever take other opinion and judge yourself at that moment. You always have to believe in yourself. Uh, this is uh, mainly for you, Doug. Uh, uh, I'm just curious what your week has been like this week, getting some of the endorsements that you have, but also still trying to focus on Friday. How have you been able to balance that? Yeah, no, uh, uh, my whole focus uh, is 100% on basketball. Uh, I'm really focused on this, on this game. Uh, we look forward to keep whatever we're doing the same. We're going to keep that going, going to Friday. The only thing that matters right now is, is beating Purdue and moving on. I mean, the, week, the week's been crazy. Uh, it's been crazy since we got here for all of us, really. And uh, we're trying to get our priorities straight, but it's very clear that our priority is getting the win. Thank you. Josh? Uh, Josh Verlin, City Basketball Love. Casey, or really, if, if any of you guys can specifically answer this question, it can be open to anybody. But uh, Clarence is from Philadelphia. I was just wondering if any of you guys have talked to him specifically about coming home and what this game means to him to be play here in Philadelphia. And if not, just you know what you feel like he's brought to the team this year. Casey, why don't you address that? Thank you. Uh, yeah, most definitely. You know, uh, this is Clarence's hometown. You know, he's very hyped about uh, coming back home and representing uh, back home and, you know, being on his big stage his freshman year. And uh, Clarence definitely has bring a lot of passion and uh, definitely drive to our team. You know, he's a big part of our team and what we do here, you know, having a kid from Philadelphia, they have toughness too. Uh, so just having him on his team and a, a, a board here is just a great thing. Next. Tom Brew from Sports Illustrated, Purdue. Darrell, um, can you tell us a little bit about what uh, just that emotional ride is like, though, from going through last weekend and winning a couple of games and then having some time off and then trying to get back into basketball mode here in the last day or two? Uh, yeah, um, you know, uh, doing what we're doing right now is going to go down in history. Um, 
all the hard work we put in is paying off at this time. Uh, but you know, like we've said earlier, we're not done yet. Uh, once it once it happened the next day, we're moving past it. The past is the past. We got to focus on the next next game and the game plan. And uh, we're just gonna go out there, execute, give it our all. And that's it. Back to Dan Galston. In the back, in green. Oh, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Zach Brazil in New York Post. Could, I guess Casey, I asked for you, could you just put in context what this opportunity means? No 15 seed has ever made an Elite Eight. It's 22 years since a New York City area team has even gotten to this stage. And, you know, you guys have gone from basically, you know, you know, off the radar it's uh, the kind of the sports story in the country right now uh, this is a this is an amazing opportunity you know this opportunity is surreal and our feelings are surreal but um you know just staying the course and you know sticking to the game plan and executing the game plan is our main focus and just staying consistent with what we do is what we're trying to do here you know uh being the underdogs and being doubted is what uh we thrive off of and you know uh we're just trying to keep all, uh that mindset and keep on doing what we're doing up here in the front felix from hot post i just want to have your reaction guys there was a tweet that said i'm cracking up about how the commentators keep acting surprised that the saint peter's men's basketball team don't seem scared of this moment of course they're not these guys have to cross kennedy boulevard every day <laughs> <laughs> that is way scarier than this game. Can you guys tell me how you guys are facing the pressure for Friday night? Let's start with Matthew. Um, <laughs> yeah, crossing Kennedy Boulevard could be tough sometimes. Uh, but no, we, 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 don't, we don't feel any pressure. Uh, we're, we're just here to play basketball and something we've been doing our, our whole career. Even though it's a bigger stage at the end of the day, it's, it's just basketball. Doug, do you want to address that? Yeah. Please. Um. That's funny what Matt said. It, it is a little difficult crossing, crossing there. Uh, but in regards to that, um, I would say that. Uh, what was the question? No, is there any pressure? Oh. There's no pressure at all. Honestly, there's no pressure at all. Um, I think that uh, there's there's nothing to, to be scared of. There's nothing really that's different now. We, we've been playing basketball this whole season. We've been, uh, we had our ups and downs, and we're just going to look forward to keep executing the game plan and just keep doing what we've been doing. Thank you. Dan? Dan Gelson, Associated Press. This is for Doug. Doug, we saw this week your chicken wing deal. You have a sweatshirt line out. And is there anything else that's out that, we're, that we haven't seen yet? Any, any? Uh, no, nothing, nothing right now. Um, have you turned down deals or opportunities? Uh, I haven't been really looking at it. As much, uh, like I said, I'm focused on getting the win on Friday. And what kind of comes with your chicken wing deal? Like, what do you get out of that? From what happened? What do you get from Buffalo Wild Wings? Is it like food for the team for you or the league? Uh, or? With all due respect, no comment. I'm sorry. Uh, right. <laughs> go back to next to Dan, and then we'll go to Zoom. Hey, uh, Dan McQuaid, Defector Media. Uh, Coach talked about how you you guys sort of the COVID break sort of helped you guys when you didn't play for for a while what what sort of changed after um after that you know this is for anybody um the COVID break uh put us on pause and it kind of uh put a perspective on things for us uh, you know uh, how the game could be taken away from you at any second so just thinking about that we knew that when we came back we had to really lock in and really focus and buy into what coach is telling us and ever since then, the uh, season went up from there. Cassini, do you want to address that? Uh, yeah, like Daryl said, it was just a blessing for us because it was like an eye opening for us. Okay, let's take a question from Zoom, Jennifer Label. Go ahead, Jennifer. Hi, yes, um, I'm in a lively with Sports Illustrated Kids, and I was just wondering from the player's per perspective what it means to you guys to feel that you've been able to represent all the people from your community and just knowing that you've been the underdogs but being able to overcome all the adversity throughout your season so far. Uh, Doug, you ready for yes, that? Uh, yeah, it, it's been awesome. Uh, it feels amazing to be an inspiration to uh, people, especially young kids uh, who may one day be, be in our shoes that we are in now. 
and uh, it, it just means a lot to all of us uh, that we're, we're inspiring people every day of what we're doing. And uh, with hard work, you can achieve anything. Matthew? Uh, yeah, like, like Doug said, it's, it's a blessing for us to, to be on this stage and, and, and put on for our cities and, and, and our family back home. Uh, but like he said, just inspiring the youth that, that, that could be in our shoes and just showing them that anything is possible is really our main goal. And one more from Zoom, Garrett Lash. Go ahead, Garrett. Hey guys, I'm Garrett Lash with Midmaker Madness. So, uh, kind of statistically all season, it's kind of been reflected that the defense is the strength of your team, and it definitely makes sense with some of Coach Holloway's comments all year. But in the tournament, offensively, you guys have been um, fantastic against the likes of Kentucky and and Murray State. Is there something that you guys have been focusing on to help? You know that you feel like has really made it all come together. Or is this just what you guys have been doing all year, and it's just uh, you know, on the biggest stage now. Um, yeah, so uh, we like to say that our defense leads to our offense. You know, if we take care of the defensive end, uh, our offense is going to come second and it's going to uh, usually flow. If we come into the game worried about our offense, that's usually when we struggle. Um, I mean, and Coach has just been harping on us being sharp, running through our sets hard, and uh, that's really what it's been. Okay, we have time for one more quick question. Zach Braziller, New York Post. When you guys have watched film of Purdue, you know, they obviously they have, they're big, they have size, they have really talented guards. Is there any, you know, intimidation factor or just kind of, you know, what you guys are going up against here? Casey, you want to take that, please? Yeah, uh, like they said before, it's just basketball, you know. I don't think you should go into any uh, game being intimidated by anybody. As a person yourself, I don't think you should be intimidated by anything. But, um, you know, we're just trying to execute the game plan, you know, go into it with the same mindset of beating beating these guys and, uh, you know, just taking it one step at a time, just focusing on a scout, focusing on practice, and then going into the game tomorrow and executing the game plan. All right, thank you very much. Best of luck to you tomorrow. Thank you. Reminder, thank you, you guys are dismissed. Thank, Thank you. you. Recording this press conference will be available in the NCA Digital Media Hub at nca.verit1.com. Transcripts are provided by SAP and will be posted shortly. And again, the uh, satellite coordinates are posted in the media workroom. Thank you for joining us. Our next press conference is with student athletes from Purdue at 1210. No, you have to, you kind of have to make your arrangements with the SID.
morning, good afternoon. Just a few reminders for everybody before we get started in a minute or so. It's courtesy to your fellow media members, we ask you to please silence your cell phones. Uh, every time you, when you do ask a question, please provide your name and affiliation. We have microphone holders on the side. Just raise your hand, make eye contact with them or with me, and we'll try to get to all of you. Uh, reminder that rec recording a video of these press conferences is prohibited. We ask you to utilize the NCA Digital Media Hub or the electronic media boxes in the video workroom. You are, however, allowed to take still photos. The satellite coordinates for the high definition feeds of all the press conferences are posted in the media workroom. Instead of me reading all of these digits, um, if you can't find them, please see one of the members of the media coordination team and we'll help you out with that. Today we're going to be have separate press conferences for each team's coach and the student athletes. And then we are also going to be joined by people on Zoom and we will go to the questions in the room first and then we'll try to uh, fit in a question or two or three from Zoom as well. Great, thanks, sir. Uh, I think we are. Yep. Again, welcome to the NCAA Division I Men's Basketball Tournament Regional Semifinals in Philadelphia. This is the practice day press conference for Purdue University. Joining us are student athletes Jaden Ivey, Zach Eady, and Trevion Williams. Reminder that we will take questions from the media room, ask you to state your name and affiliation first, and welcome to Philadelphia and the NCAA Tournament. We are now open to questions for the student athletes. Brian Newbert from goldenblack.com. Guys, for whoever wants this, are there any challenges that come with kind of playing a Cinderella, um, somebody who's obviously drawing a lot of attention for the run they're making? Let's start. Could Jaden, could you start, please? Uh, you know, just with that, I feel like, you know, they have a lot of confidence um, in themselves. Um, and, you know, it, there's it's every team, you know, you play in the tournament you respect. Um, and, you know, just going into the game, you know, we just got to be locked in and ready. Um, and I, I believe we are. Zach? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of teams underestimated them. Um, they kind of doubted their ability because of the number next to their name. But we're coming to this game like we're playing the 2 seed because they beat the 2 seed. So we just have to uh, have that mentality that they're a really good team and that we have to respect them. Austin Petalolo, Trenton Philly Hoop. Zach? They don't really have a ton of size, or at least seven footers like you. What do you have to do to kind of take advantage of that? Um, yeah, it's kind of been the um, the thing for the last two teams. They haven't really had the size to match up, so just kind of dominating the offensive glass, um, getting my shots off, drawing a lot of fouls, because that's what they have to do to guard me. Um, just kind of keep playing like I have the last two games, and hopefully it works. <laughs> Chris Murray, Philadelphia Sunday Sun. Um, and any, any one of you guys can take this question. Um, much has been said about them coming in. They have a, have a huge chip on your shoulders, on their shoulders and all that. Is that the mentality that you guys have? I mean, you know, I've, I've read where you, where you guys have been hungry to make this run through the Big Ten, I mean, through the um, NCAA tournament, especially coming out of a rough conference like the Big Ten. Travion, could you start? Um, yeah, definitely, man. If you just look at the past couple years, you know, seeing what we've been through, you know, obviously my freshman year making it to an Elite Eight and being five seconds away from a Final Four. And then my sophomore year, um, you know, with with COVID and, you know, just things, we, we had to kind of win out to kind of make the tournament. And then my junior year, COVID, and then now it's, we're back in this position. So, um, man, it, it's just a tough thing to deal with. Um, but you've, you've looked at, you know, the past couple of years and you've slipped up, uh, you've came short, you know, whether it's you've lost in the first round or 
uh, something off the court. But, um, man, just looking at the position we've been put in multiple times, um, we, we just can't let it slip away. So um, we've been all, always been right there. We just got to get it. So. Tom Bruce, Sports Illustrated, Purdue. Trevion, uh, Purdue's been to uh, four Sweet Sixteens now in the last five years. Um, is what most is gained from there in regards to not necessarily dealing with the games last weekend and this weekend, but just sort of handling that in between time in regards to getting us, you know, just going from one week to the next and keeping it flowing more like a regular season type of thing. Um, you know, it's been a lot of positivity, you know, within our locker room. Um, I would say, you know, usually when we go back home, you know, we watch a lot of film, we get off our feet. You know, we get a lot of shots up, and we've been kind of just keeping that same routine. Um, you know, Coach has been taking bits and pieces out of the, the games we've played, and, you know, he, he looks at the good, he looks at the bad, and um, we just kind of move forward from there. But um, it's, everything is pretty straightforward. It's all about, you know, staying positive and who can, you know, play well together at this time of year. So. Hey, uh, Travion, Greg Doyle from the Indy Star. Um, there's only one – kind of Cinderella really here, and you're playing it. Um, and I heard what Zach said about playing, they're like a two seed because they'd be a two seed. How do you balance the fact that people think you should win with you guys knowing they just be a two seed, so you know it won't be that easy, and yet it's like a vicious cycle? Um, yeah, man, you just got to, you know, I, I think our, our mindset going into this tournament or just coming to Philly, um, just treating every team like they're the best team in the tournament. Um, you know, they're here for a reason. And, you know, like, like he said, you got to respect them. Um, we've already, like I said, we, if you just look at what we've been through, you know, as a team, you know, we losing in the first round in North Texas, nobody expected that. But, uh, you know, I don't think we, we respected them. I don't think we were, were as ready as we thought we were. And, um, you know, we're kind of in a similar situation where guy where people look, you know, look at the matchup and like, oh, Purdue's supposed to win. But um, in reality, man, you can be beat on any given night. So. Um, it's all about respecting them, um, you know, also having fun and uh, just taking care of the basketball. Felix? Uh, Felix from Post. This question is for Jaden. Jaden, are you more nervous about your mom's matchup with Notre Dame, their Sweet 16 matchup, or your matchup on Friday night versus St. Peter's? To answer that, I'm not nervous at all. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, I put a lot of work in, um, you know, to get here. You know, to be on a great team like this, um, and you know, I'm not nervous. And you know, my mom's been in the same situation. She's been in uh, a lot of you know tournament games where she's lost, and she's you know won a tournament game. She's won a national championship. So, um, you know, I don't think she's nervous at all either. Here in the front, Alexa Ross, CBS Sports, Fox 59. Guys, there's another level to the Cinderella team. They're 93 miles away from their school, so they can pack a place like you guys pack Mackey. It is obviously a lot bigger, but what challenges does that, fa does that face for you having, knowing that they will have a pretty predominantly home crowd here? Yeah, I'm good. Would you like that? To yeah, I think um, coming from the Big Ten, we're, we're used to loud crowds. It's, uh, it's not nothing crazy for us. Uh, I think Big Ten has some of the loudest stadiums in the country. Uh, just playing these last two games, even though they're March Madness games, I, I would say most of our Big Ten conference games were louder. Um, so it's not really like the crowd doesn't play a factor uh, for us just coming from where we in our conference. Taylor Tannenbaum, uh, WTHR in Indy. Travion, this is for you. I talked to Carson and Ryan Klein last night, and, and they both said how cool it is to watch you guys when you were role players back mm -hmm. then, last time you made this run, to now you guys being the leaders. How much different is it for you in this role now, knowing what you've been through, but applying that and, and being in that role that they were once in when you made that Sweet 16 Elite Eight run? Um, man, it was obviously a pleasure to, to, to go through that my freshman year. You know, you don't walk in as a freshman and think you're going to go that far, or you, you don't think that, you know, your minutes are, or how you contribute is going to play a part in how far we go. Um, you just kind of had to be ready and, you know, when your number was called. So, um, like I said, you have so much coming at you as a freshman. And like I said, I didn't expect um, for us to, to be so successful. But, you know, just looking back on it and being in the position now, um, you know, I'm just happy to be here. Um, I kind of know what to expect. You know, these guys have been through it, um, losing the first round. So, you know, everybody's got their own piece of how it feels um, to win and lose. And I think we've now we're at the point where we're just kind of like putting it together. So, Adam in the back. 
Uh, yeah, uh, Adam Kilgore with the Washington Post. I'm hoping I could ask this of Travion and uh, Zach. Um, Purdue has such a good recent lineage of, of big men. Um, what, what makes uh, Purdue such a good place for, for a big man to play? Um, and if I could ask uh, specifically to Zach, it, you know, there's been some you know, guys at Purdue who are even taller than a typical seven footer, um, Matt and Isaac obviously. Is, is there some other system that, that is, you know, really suits um, a, a player like that? Thanks. Yeah, it's really just the um the way that we play on offense and the way that we use, we play on defense. Um, on offense, we really try to stress getting the ball inside, even in practice. It's not just in the game. Like every day, they're stressing to, for us to get post touches, for us to get comfortable with the ball down low, for us to make the right reads out of double teams, stuff like that. Uh, we have great coaches, obviously, with Coach Brantley, Coach Painter. They really know how to develop big people because they've been through it with a, with a bunch of big people. Uh, just working on the fundamentals, it's not like we do anything really crazy. I, didn't really, I don't do anything crazy. Isaac really never did anything crazy. Matt doesn't do anything crazy. Travion, he does some crazy stuff, but it still, <laughs> it still works. Um, but like, it's just, oh, it's really wow. just keeping it fundamental, keeping it, um, and keeping it uh, simple for the most part for me. Uh, I mean, yeah, I just, just kind of to bounce off that, uh, I think most importantly for, you know, our coaches, um, they do stress to, get the ball down low and um, sometimes the big man game gets forgotten about, um, you know, in, in today's world. So um, I would say outside of basketball, I think uh, the, the one thing that separates our coaches from other coaches is um, how well they, you know, can communicate with the person rather than the player. Um, you know, they take time to, to get to know you and understand you um, as a person. And I think it makes it easier on the court. So. Jaden, you seem to be another guard in the line of dynamic Purdue guards that seem to make a name for themselves in March, such as Carson Edwards. I don't know if you have a relationship with him or any of the other guys, but do you ever really talk to them, kind of get advice from them, knowing that they've been here before? Uh, yeah. Uh, I really started to build kind of a relationship with Carson um, over the past year. Um, you know, we just, you know, he wished me good luck um, the first round. Um, you know, I really – you know, got to know him, um, and obviously, you know, seeing him play, you know, he's one of the reasons why, you know, I came to Purdue, um, you know, just seeing how he, you know, helped his team win um, and, you know, led him, um, you know, I really, you know, looked at that into my, it played in, you know, my decision on coming here. Um, so, yeah, I definitely still, you know, keep in contact with him. Uh, this is for uh, Rob Doster with Field of 68. This is for Jaden. Um, you have someone on either side of you that should be an all-conference center. Uh, you can't play two centers at the same time. Um, to see them sacrifice minutes and sacrifice accolades and sacrifice numbers, uh, what has that impact been like on the, the Purdue roster and the Purdue team as a whole? Um, I think, you know, it's big. I, obviously, you know, these two guys, you know, sitting beside me, you know, they're great players and they, you know, they work really hard. Um, and, you know, regardless of what, you know, type of accolades that they, they get or they don't get, you know, I still love, you know, playing with them. And, you know, I, I know, you know, on a daily basis, you know, they're, they're going to give it their all. Um, and, you know, just, you know, just playing with them is so, so much fun. And, um, you know, I just love being around them. Thanks, bro. <laughs> You're welcome. You know, I'd like to go to questions from Zoom. We'll go to Anna Label. Jen, could you help us with that? Go ahead, Anna. Hello, I'm Anna with Sports Illustrated Kids, and I was just wondering, like, throughout the highs and lows of this season, how do you feel your team has stayed consistent to help you get to this point in the season as you hope to reach Purdue's sixth Elite Eight appearance? Could you repeat that again, Anna, please? Sure. Um, I'm Anna Lively with Sports Illustrated Kids. I was just wondering, throughout the highs and lows of this season, how do you feel your team has stayed consistent to help you get to this point as you hope to reach Purdue's sixth career Elite Eight appearance? Um, you know, I, I definitely think um, it's about staying together. Um, I think every, every team goes through adversity at some point in their season. And, you know, we hit adversity. Uh, we 
hit a couple losses on, you know, buzzer beaters. And, um, you know, we've had a lot of stuff happen. And it's just, at the end of the day, it's about, you know, staying together and, um, you know, just having fun on the court. You know, we um, – sometimes when teams lose, they, they kind of forget about the good, you know, from those games. And um, we've been, you know, mostly working on just trying to put it all together. Um, you know, and that's how you kind of have to go about it. You know, you got to take the good and the bad and, and trying to figure out a way to, to keep improving. You know, coach tells us all the time, you know, we haven't, we still haven't reached our ceiling. You know, some teams in this tournament um, have reached their ceiling. I know we still have a lot of room to improve and, um, and you know, it, it shows, you know, if we take care of the basketball, uh, there's a lot more to us. I think we have time for one more. So we'll go to OJ on Zoom. Uh, yes, this question is for. Yes, this is a two-part question for Jaden. Uh, with you being known, your game, part of your game being above the rim, do you anticipate St. Peter's to have a game plan to try to kind of keep you grounded or try to keep you out of the pain? And also, uh, with both of you and your mom, Coach Ivy, competing in the tournaments, uh, what do you guys do to interact with each other for encouragement? Um, you know, I feel like the Texas game, you know, that their game plan was, you know, try to get me out of the rhythm early. Um, you know, I felt like, you know, my teammates, you know, stepped up big. And, you know, when I got the ball, I tried to, you know, make plays for my teammates because I knew, you know, Texas was going to be, you know, heavy on, you know, stopping me and, um, you know, trying to, you know, limit, you know, my paint touches. Um, and you know, I felt like, you know, my teammates stepped up. And, you know, I'm just going to keep going to that, you know, utilizing my teammates and, you know, getting them involved. Um, early, you know, so we can, you know, withstand the game and, you know, try to, you know, get a win. Um, and then, you know, secondly, you know, it's just a blessing to be able to, you know, play here and, um, you know, having, you know, my mother, you know, being a Sweet 16, um, you know, it's just a blessing from God. And, um, you know, we're just going to, you know, keep going and, you know, see how far we can go. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. Wish you the best of luck tomorrow night. Thank you. You're dismissed. Thank you. Thank you. We will, our next press conference will be with Purdue head coach Matt Painter momentarily. Again, reminders, silence the cell phones. Also, provide your name and media affiliation. And remember that there is no recording, video recording of these press conferences. Satellite coordinates are posted in the workroom. Again, ask us if you need help locating them. Recording of the press conference will be available in the NCA Digital Media Hub at ncaa.veritone.com. Transcripts of this and every press conference will be provided by ASAP. And once this is concluded, that this press conference will be posted shortly. We do appreciate your cooperation and your, your attendance.
following this press conference. The next one will be North Carolina coach Hubert Davis at 1250, followed by the North Carolina players. And then at 205, UCLA's player, players, followed by coach Mick Cronin at 220. You're welcome to make an opening statement, unless you otherwise we can just open the floor to questions. Let's so ready to go. Is this on? Uh, Austin Pedalo, Chairman Philly Hoops. Matt, heading into this weekend, and given the way the bracket is kind of shaped out, and I know can't look at the numbers of the seeds, but with this team, do you feel like there's an added sense of pressure to kind of get over that hump and get to New Orleans? Not really. I mean, obviously, it's a goal of ours to um, continue to win and you know hopefully get to a Final Four. But if you just keep it process based, then you know you're playing a, a very competitive team that's had two great wins, which I think everybody can say um, in the Sweet 16. But I think just keeping our focus there, um, you know, I'm just I'm just impressed with St. Peter's. I'm impressed with how hard they play. I'm how, how competitive they are. They got guys that come off the bench that are starters. They're deep. They're well coached. And so, you know, we're going to have our hands full there. I think when you, the NCAA tournament, I know the numbers speak for themselves because the higher number normally um, advances, but that's what makes this special in March Madness. And um, it's about matchups. And so, you know, we'll, we'll see if this is a good matchup for us. Like you can look on paper and dissect it all you want, but when, once you get out there and, you know, our, if our competitive spirit's better than theirs, we're going to give ourselves a really good chance. If it's not, then they're going to have the advantage there. Uh, over here, Coach. Coley Harvey, ESPN. Uh, kind of along those lines, what is the message you tell your team about staying locked in despite what the number is next to the other right. team's name? Yeah, it really doesn't affect us. I, I think we can beat anybody in the country, and if we turn the ball over, I think we can get beat by a lot of people. I think we've, we've shown both of those areas, and their ability to turn people over is really good. So we got to be able to handle their pressure and their, um, they might be six, seven, but you know, in depth, who's going to block your shot, you know, they, but they're fast they're quick. They keep people in front of them. They play passing lanes. Um, my college coach always said good players can be in two places at one time. And I realized then I wasn't a very good player, um, <laughs> at that moment. Um, but they have a lot of people that can be in two places at one time. They're active. They're all over the place. So um, it's not about numbers. It's about matchups. And uh, we, we just have to focus on ourselves and taking care of the basketball, but also understand what they're trying to do. He's got some real good packages of what they do offensively, and he really uses his personnel. Um, he spreads you out. He drives it. they got quick hitters for threes. Um, they'll backdoor you. He, he does a good job, man. He's, he's a really good coach. Coach? Uh, over here. Thank you. Felix from Hard Post. Um, so St. Peter's Sh Shaheen Holloway mentioned that he has players from New Jersey and New York that they're not scared of anything. What do you have to say about your group of guys heading into Friday night? Well, I think we have a lot of experience. Um, our three seniors played in an Elite Eight game and came three-tenths of a second from going to a Final Four when they were freshmen. 
Um, we've been um, a little bit all over the map. Um, last year we were four seed in the NCAA tournament, got knocked off in the first round. The year before that we would have had to win um, probably a couple games in our Big Ten tournament at least to get in the NCAA tournament. You know, as freshmen, those guys won our won the league. This year we came up a little bit short in our tournament or whatever. So we are, it's, you know, we have good experience. Um, we have good skill, have good athleticism. We got a dynamic guard in Jay Nivey. We got good leadership from our seniors, good size. Um, so just really playing to our strengths. I think um, what he's really lending to is that competitive spirit that I was talking about. Like St. Peter's has got a great competitive spirit about them. And that's what you need. That's what you need uh, to win games. And obviously, they're talented. And that's what we have to be able to do. You know, you, you have to be able to play harder and play smarter than your opponent. I know that's a, a little hokey, um, but it's true. And I think that's going to be the challenge for both teams. Felix, if you hand that to Adam Zagoria, please. And then we'll go back. Hey, Matt. Adam Zagoria, how are you? Good. Um, a bunch of coaches still in the tournament played at the schools they're coaching. You played at Purdue. Hubert, UNC, and some of these guys also played in the NBA. Hubert, Penny was in the tournament, Juwan Howard. Do you notice kind of a trend of more schools hiring famous NBA alums? And how appealing is that for the kids who obviously all want to get to the NBA to, to learn from guys like that? Right. Well, I think, you know, just the passion you have for your alma mater. You know, it's you know, wanting to see Purdue win. Even if I wasn't the coach at Purdue, I'd want to see Purdue win and be successful and continue to do the you know, the right things. But yeah, I think when you're looking from a recruiting standpoint, it's how can you help young men develop to where they want to go and reach their goals? Now these guys are on the different end of that. You know, they've been in the NBA, they've played in the NBA. Now that's really their track record going forward once they're in college. Like what did they do to help those guys? Sometimes when you have guys for nine months, like, you know, you, you helped them but it's such a short window. A lot of those are the overly talented guys um, that, that leave early. But when you have guys for three, four, five years, and then they develop into an NBA player, I think that's what you're looking for. And that's where we've been. Like we've had one McDonald's All-American in 17 years, but yet we've been pretty successful. And you go look at people that consistently have McDonald's All-Americans outside of four or five people, and then you like see our, our success versus their success and plus we graduate our guys. We just have a great balance at Purdue. I know I'm making my recruiting speech to people right now, <laughs> but it's what it's about. Like, you know, having two dreams is what it's about and, and, and not having a narrow vision. And, and if you can understand that a, a, a college scholarship have helped so many kids, that's why I fight, you know, and I don't like the one-time transfer because I think it's foolish. I think it can help individual kids. I think it's the right move for certain individuals, but when you throw a lot of data out and you have 360 teams and you have 13 scholarship players, at the end of the day, aren't we trying to help them have a better life through this opportunity? And I always talk about myself and like, you know, if stuff I would have stumbled and things would have happened, everybody in my family went to college, from aunts to uncles to whatever, like, you know, you take some people from low, lower socioeconomic backgrounds that don't have as many resources and they transfer three times, who have they been loyal to? Who have they really been loyal to? So who's going to be there for them going forward in life? Because that's the whole thing, having a better life through an opportunity. And those are the things that we got to look at. Those are the things that we got to be better at because that's what it is. It's like going to the Army or going to the Navy or doing whatever. And now that's really helped you and gave you that discipline. And that's what it is, man. You know, giving those guys discipline and having fun and having a great experience. But if they're bouncing around all the time, you know, that's, you know, you got to live two dreams, man. You got to live a dream through basketball, but you got to live. If you get a chance to live a dream through education and then you have a whole institution that's going to help you the rest of your life, man, that, that seems intelligent to me. Tom. Tom Bruce, Sports Illustrated, Purdue. Matt, you guys have been to uh, four Sweet 16s in the last five years. Uh, outside of the games last weekend and the games this weekend, how much does all of that experience help in regards just to sort of dealing with Monday through Friday? Y yeah, it's, it's a great you know, point. What I've really gotten to uh, after the Big Ten tournament and after our, our two games is to make sure I spend the next day watching us. And everybody's like, you know, get ready for your opponent, you know, because Yale's a good opponent or Texas is a good opponent or Virginia Tech's a good opponent. They're all good opponents, but the most important team in the tournament is your team. And so just locking in to making sure that we're not making the same mistakes or magnifying the good things that we're doing and, and really being encouraging to our guys 
like we're doing some really good things here, but it gets lost in winning. You know, you, you're making mistakes when you win, you know, and you're doing some, you know, you're doing some really, really good things when you lose and like just trying to have that balance and understand your team, then really diving in, you know, to your opponent and, and seeing where you can have some advantages with it. But just keeping it process based and not jumping over it and not worried about some of the questions you guys have asked about numbers or underdogs or Cinderella's or whatever. Just focus in on St. Peter's and just how good of a team they are. Because if you don't, they're going to beat you. I think they've proven that. Adam in the back. Uh, hi, Matt. Uh, back uh, Adam Kilgore with the Washington Post. Um, you've had in your program three guys, seven, two or taller, and another one coming next year, um, which, which seems like more than a coincidence. Um, and knowing you've had a lot of really good big men who are more like standard, you know, seven footers or six tens. Like, is, is there something about that, about that exceptionally tall player that's in a particular fit with your system or your philosophy? Yeah. Um, well, obviously it happens initially organically when you first start. You know, our first big guy that I coached here that was a good player was Carl Landry, and he was a traditional four in the NBA. And then it just grew from um, Juwan Johnson, A.J. Hammonds, Isaac Haas, Caleb Swanigan, um, now Travion Williams, Zach Eady. I'm probably missing somebody in there somewhere. I didn't want to leave anybody out. But it just kind of happened. And Purdue has played inside out. You know, if you look in the, in the 80s, you know, with Russell Cross, Jim Rowinski, Melvin McCants, Steve Scheffler, um, into the 90s, like they had Brad Miller. Um, and so, like, when you look at some of those, those guys already, so Purdue's had a, a great – experience of having a really good size. Obviously, Joe Barry Carroll, last time we went to the Final Four in 1980, was the number one pick in the draft. Glenn Robinson um, wasn't a traditional post like that, but he was a big guy, especially in college. So the more success you can have with something and now being able to show them, it's like every coach in America 15 years ago would say, hey, we're going to run the basketball, we're pushing the basketball, we play an exciting brand of ball. And then the next coach would say the same thing. Then the next coach would say the same thing. Well, you all are – not everybody's doing that. But that's what's appealing to a recruit's ear, right? They want to hear that. Well, now analytically you see numbers and you see things. So you can present this to them and say, hey, we were the second best team in the country last year at throwing the ball inside. And, like, you'll see other schools that are recruiting them that don't ever throw the ball inside. They might dive to the rim and get the ball in a lob or something of that nature. And so we've been able to have guys – with that kind of size, but also analytically show them, hey, you're going to get the ball here. Like, you're going to get the ball in low post positions. You're going to get the ball in dive positions. We're not just going to use you as a guy that, that defends and rebounds and sets ball screens, and that's it, even though all three of those things are very important parts of the game. And then we show them the evolution of really their decision making. That's the difference. You really got to work with big guys on their decision making more than anything. Because we all get frustrated with big guys. You throw them the ball, they drop it. Okay, I'm never throwing it to you again. Throw the ball to them, they throw it away. I'm never throwing it to you again. Even though that guard turns it over three and a half times a game, that's the way guards think. They just, well, we won't throw it to him. Well, we're opposite of that. We've been able to grow with that. We've been able to learn. Each one of our big guys, especially guys like Zach, that cause different problems, it really teaches us a lot because the defenses throw a lot of different looks at them. And then you're able to manipulate that defense and kind of play what you want but then it's just kind of grown from there and you know guys see that this is a great place to get an education but it's also a great place for a seven footer i think we have time for one more up front hey coach taylor tannenbaum from wthr and in indy you mentioned your three leaders and how close they were uh, to, to making it to the final four to watch them as a coach go from those guys coming off the bench back then and, and to where they are now right how cool is that for you and, and the second part of that is you know it's one thing for you as a coach to preach to them about this tournament and what they need to right. do, but how have you seen them kind of step up, maybe even in just the last couple of weeks, that trio right. preach to their own players and their own people, hey, this is what we need to do. I've been here before. Yeah, well, one of them was first team all league last year, and um, it was sixth man of the year this year. Um, so he's made a lot of sacrifices to help our team win, and Travion Williams. Eric Hunter didn't start the first half of the season, um, and now he's, he has started here. And so, you know, they've had true tests of, the, of their character and are you you know are you really wanting to do what's best for the team and they have proven that Sasha Stefanovic had no high major offers I told him if he comes he's going to have to redshirt um, he's still you know he wanted to be at Purdue and those guys have proven that they've wanted to stay at Purdue 
I always say everybody has a reason to leave, you know, but if you stay and you fight, you know, the rewards are going to be a lot higher if there's nothing wrong. And there's nothing wrong with adversity. And these guys have handled adversity and they've pushed through. And that's why they'll be successful. You know, whether we win or lose our next game or not, these guys are all going to be successful, get their degrees at Purdue. And uh, just happy for them. They, they've done a great job for our program. Thank you, Coach. Thank Good you. Luck. Best of luck tomorrow. All right. Thank you. Our next press conference will be with the University of North Carolina head coach Hubert Davis at approximately 1250. Thank you. Reminders for those of you who are just joining us for the first time, we ask you to sign us to your cell phones, please. Also provide your name and media affiliation every time you ask a question. And the rec video recording of these press conferences is prohibited. Please use the NCA Digital Media Hub or the electronic media boxes in the video workroom. You are, however, allowed to take still photos. Satellite coordinates for the high def feeds of all the press conferences are posted in the media workroom.
too, but I got you here. It's all right. Hi, how are you? Oh, cool, great. This is the practice day press conference for the University of North Carolina. Joining us now is head coach Hubert Davis. We're going to open it up to questions. Please raise your hand and let the mic holders see you. We'll start right here in the front. Greg Barnes, Inside Carolina. Uh, Hubert, over the last nine games, your team's held its opponents to below 41% shooting. I know Leakey plays a big part of that, but that's the team wide thing. Is is that a matter of the guys buying in after that Pittsburgh loss, or are you doing anything different schematically? No, I mean we're not we're not doing anything um, different. You know we've emphasized all year the importance of us being a good defensive team. We've identified you know the three things that make us successful, and that's playing good defense, rebounding the basketball, and also. Um, taking care of the basketball, limit our turnovers. And I think over the last, that stretch, nine games, and throughout the year, we've gotten better at it and we've gotten um, more consistent at it. And I also think that our guys are, you, you talked about buying in. I think they're seeing how successful we're becoming because of how consistent we are on the defensive end. And so I don't know if that's, you want to call it buying in, but I think they're experiencing the success of us doing a better job on a defensive end, and it's obviously made her, made us a better basketball team. Go to Adam Zagoria. Hey, Hubert. Adam hey. Zagoria, New York Times. How you doing? Hey, how are you? I'm um, good. Um, you know, you're one of several coaches in the tournament who played in the NBA and is coaching at their alma mater. You know, Penny Hardaway, Juwan Howard, guys like Shaheen and – John Shire played professionally. Um, how appealing is it, do you think, to these kids who obviously all want to get to the NBA to be coached by somebody like yourself who played in the NBA? And, and are there any specific you know, examples on how you help them and prepare them to, to get to where they want to go? Well, I always think it's important to have people um, around you that have experienced and been through and have been where you want to be, you know? And so, you know, not just for myself, our entire coaching staff, you know, everybody on our coaching staff went to Carolina, played at Carolina, and with the exception of one of our assistant coaches, every one of our wives went to Carolina. So, you know, it's, it's been tried, tested, proven successful. And so, you know, when we're talking to the guys, they can look at us and say, you know what, you've been there before. And then you talk about not just my experience, but, you know, um, Sean May played in the NBA, um, Pat Sullivan coached 18 years in the NBA, um, Jeff Lebo played in the NBA and also coached in the NBA. That type of experience, I think, is valuable for our players. It's valuable in recruiting um, because we've been there before. So I think it's a huge factor. Do you, do you see this as a trend? I mean, obviously, Penny and Juwan and – uh, it d doesn't seem like this was the case 20, 30 years ago. Do you think more schools are going to go in this direction if you guys are successful? I don't know. I, I, I can only draw on, you know, my own experience. And for me, this is not a job. To me, this is, this is missionary work. Um, it really is. It's, it's put me in a position where I can help and serve and coach and teach and give back to these kids everything that Coach Smith and Coach Guthridge gave to me the four years that I was there and also give back to the kids everything that Coach Williams gave to his players for 18 years. And so to be in that position is very humbling. I'm, I'm very thankful and appreciative, and it's a great place to be. Matt, front here. Hey, Hubert. Uh, Matt DeGeorge from the Delco Times. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any memories of the last time being here in Philly in 2016. Yeah, we things won against <laughs> Indiana, and we won against Notre Dame. Yeah. To, being on familiar ground, does that uh, – I wonder for you personally if that helps at all this week. Um, I, I don't – well, it doesn't help because I'm not playing. And and if I was out there now, I would really hurt them right now at 51 years old. The, the, the thing that, that I am enjoying and I just enjoyed with practice today is that with the exception of Leakey, nobody has ever been in this situation before in the Sweet 16. 
and to see the uh, not just the determination and the fight and the will and the want to, but also the excitement and the enjoyment of being in this in a stage that they've never experienced before, brings tremendous joy to me. Um, that's what I love. You know, every day I get a front row seat to be able to experience things with each one of these players and to see how happy and excited and motivated um, they are to be in this position is um, is something that that I've really enjoyed. Let's go right next. Ross Martin. <laughs> Ross Martin, Inside Carolina. Coach, all season you've talked about getting these players to play in big games and have and win big games and have that Carolina experience. I feel like after the win at Duke and this run, you've kind of accomplished that. And then what does that feel like? And if so, what does it feel like? I, I, I definitely do feel like now they have their own stories, their own testimonies, their own memories of being in big time moments and coming up big in, in, in big time games, I do. Um, as I said before, I want them to have memories, plural, and stories, and, and testimonies, and I don't want it to stop. I actually, at the end of practice yesterday, I told them, I said, if anybody asked me, what, from a player's perspective, for me personally, what is the greatest experience that I ever had as a player? And I would tell them is when I got to go to the Final Four in 91. And I said, guys, I went to the Final Four and we lost. I said, I played 12 years in the NBA. I, and my number one greatest experience personally as a player was to play in the Final Four. And I said, guys, I, I desperately want you to have that experience. I want you to get to the Final Four. I want you to get to the final game. I want you to do that. So yes, they are getting memories and stories and testimonies, but I don't want it to stop there. I wanted them to have more. Right here. C.L. Brown, Raleigh News and Observer. Hubert, um, I was curious if you saw a big difference between Brady Manick when Dawson was still in the lineup and in the rotation and once he actually left and it was kind of like Brady had to play more minutes. Is it as simple as there are more shots and minutes to go around so that's led Brady to Brady's increase or was there something else to it? Well, no, I mean, he obviously – there's there's more minutes to be had, and um, to, to be honest with you, CL, like Brady's playing at such a high level right now. I, it didn't matter who we had on the team; he would be on out there on the floor. And you know, at times, even when we had our full lineup, when Brady was in a rhythm on both ends of the floor, I kept him out there on the floor. I've said this before, like the chemistry between Armando and Brady has worked from day one. It just has. They just play off of each other. Their skills complement each other. Their personalities complement each other. And when, when they're out there on the floor, we are at our best. Hubert, David Teal, Richmond Times Dispatch. You mentioned Armando's <clears throat> personality. He seems, <laughs> you smile, he, he seems to have this mischievous side to him if so how does that manifest itself and also his serious side because he won your team's top scholar athlete award well i wouldn't characterize him as mischievous i, I would characterize him as a is a very competitive but also light-hearted kid that has a tremendous um a tremendous heart and a tremendous um, value on team I've known Armando since he was 15 years old. And he's always wanted to go to Carolina. He's always wanted to be a part of this. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's always wanted to be a part of this program. And when I talked about the joy that I feel for the players, I probably feel more for him because, you know, the three years that he was here, the first year we didn't have a winning season. Last year we lost in the first round. And I feel like now he's getting the Carolina experience. And so for me, that brings me great joy. And I've known Armando for a number of years, and I love coaching him. Here. Coach, Andrew Jones, Tar Heel Illustrated. Uh, we've talked a lot about RJ's assists and his shooting and those kind of things. But as he's been on the ball more and more during the course of the season, how has his game management improved as far as get, you know, getting the guys in the right stuff and sort of the setting the tone you know, from that perspective offensively. Yeah, he's done, he's done a terrific job. Uh, you know, he's a guard 
And so he's not a point guard or a shooting guard. He can play off the ball or with the ball in his hands. But we really like the ball in his hands because he consistently makes good decisions. He has a great understanding of when to pass and when to shoot. And he gets his uh, players involved and gets them the ball in the right spots. You know, last week in Fort Worth, you know, the first game against Marquette, he had 12 assists. And then the next game, he knew that he needed to be more aggressive on the offensive end. And he ended up having 30. And so that versatility as a guard, I mean, it's just, it, it, it's valuable to us. And I think the other area that he's gotten a lot better at is defensively. You know, one of the things that I talked to him about was because of his size, he can be a factor on the defensive end. I wanted him, I wanted opposing teams to talk about him defensively on their scouting report. And I think he's taken that challenge and he's done a better job defensively and he's having a terrific season. Tarek Patel from the Los Angeles Daily News. Coach, maybe a little about UCLA, kind of a two-part question. One is what are the challenges you think they bring you? Uh, and then, um, you know, Jaime Hawkes, we don't know. So do you kind of have to change your game plan at all, not knowing if he's going to play or what have you? No, I think, the, you know, the challenge for UCLA is they're a really great team and they're extremely well coached. Um, it's a team that has a number of gifted players that can consistently, from an offensive standpoint, create a shot for themselves and for their teammates pretty much every time. And, you know, their lineup, they basically play four guards and one big. And so, obviously, that's going to put a guard on one of our big guys. And so, um, you know, the battle is, can we take advantage of their, <clears throat> their lack of size and get the ball into the post or attack the basket through post or penetration? Or is their perimeter play going to be a factor for us because we're bigger. And they're also an outstanding defensive team. You know, I think uh, on the Pac-12 first team defensive team, I think they have three players on there. Two of them come off the bench. That's impressive. <laughs> so, you know, there's a reason why they got to the Final Four last year, and reason why they're one of the better teams in the country is because they're really good on the offensive end and they get after it defensively. Jordan Kramer, CBS 17. Uh, Hubert, for the last couple of months, it seems like your players have really embraced being in an underdog role. And during that time, you've had a lot of fighting mantras, whether it be, you know, uh, take the first punch, plant your feet, stand your ground, fight back. Do you feel like a city like Philadelphia that is kind of infamous for this underdog boxers may be a, a good backdrop to your fight <laughs> continuing? Well, you know, my, my message to them hasn't been from the standpoint of being an underdog. My, my message to them has been to change the narrative. So it hasn't been from an underdog standpoint. It's I just felt like the narrative with this group was that they weren't tough. They weren't resilient. <clears throat> Excuse me. They did not, this wasn't a team of perseverance. And I said, the only way that they can change is you're going to have to change it. And so I've never felt and I've never talked to them specifically about like an underdog role, but I have. I have motivated them and challenged them um, to change the narrative of us not being competitive and competing and shying away from physicality. It's something that I wanted them to embrace and I wanted, wanted it to be a part of our team. Trayvon Miles, ABC 11. <coughs> Hubert, a couple of different times uh, during this run, um, your guys have said you know, how anxious they are to get back out there after today's practice. <coughs> Uh, how ready would you say they are for tomorrow? Oh, we would play today. We love to play. We love to compete. And what a great opportunity it is to play against an unbelievable uh, UCLA team. Um, that's one of the, th you know, we were talking today at the end of practice, and I asked them, what, what practice was this? And they said, 98. And Armando says, I want to get to 100. I want to get to triple digits. I said, okay. Well, that means then we got to practice on Sunday. I mean, on Saturday. And then that means we got to go practice back at home. And so um, our guys are, are excited. They're motivated. Um, um, they accept the challenge of playing a great team tomorrow night, and we're ready to go. Two more right here and then <coughs> back there. Hey, Coach Davis, T uh, Taylor Vipolis, Inside Carolina. You guys are scoring at an elite level on possessions that end in a Caleb Love catch and shoot, 1.4 points per possession. What do you think has kind of led to Love being such a more efficient shooter this season? Well, I think, you know, I think there's three 
clear things of why Caleb is a much better shooter this year compared to last year. I think, number one, it, you know, it's because of him. It's, it, it's his hard work. He's a guy that consistently, before and after practice, early mornings, late nights, he's a guy that's always getting up extra shots. Um, number two is, I, a, a huge reason is his shot selection <laughs> is much better. I've always felt like, you know, you, you have a better chance of making shots if you take good shots. And I really believe that um, Caleb's uh, shot selection has gotten a lot better from last year to this year. And then, you know, just, you know, last year was both for him and RJ, they were just freshmen. And one of the things that, you know, Caleb and, and our freshmen didn't have last year is they didn't have older guys at their position that could tell them what to do. And you know to teach them how to prepare and how to how to practice and how to play and so they just basically came to Chapel Hill and here's the keys and just play and so you know the the maturity standpoint of just growth natural growth from a freshman to a sophomore year I think played a huge factor and, and again he's having a terrific year and I absolutely love coaching Caleb Love. Final question. Hey coach, Cole Nowak, Philly Sports Digest. As you see in most tournament games, the lower seed might jump out to a 10, 15 point advantage. You guys last week were up by 25 and everything that happened in that second half and you guys were able to weather the storm and come out in overtime with the victory. Do you think that has really propelled you guys with positive momentum moving forward with maybe an unexperienced team in the tournament? Well, I do. I think not just the experience that we had with Baylor, I think you know, what allowed us and helped us in the situation with Baylor was the experiences that we had earlier in the year. You know, we were in overtime against Syracuse and also Louisville. We were in tight games against Duke and, um, you know, other teams. And uh, Clemson was a, a, you know, late shot, late, late game situation. So we had been there before. So, you know, when things were um, very tight, in the second half with Baylor, those are things and those are conversations that we talked about in the huddle and things that we could grab and hold on to and understand that we have been successful in these situations. And that gave us in that Baylor game two things. One, it gave us confidence and it also gave us peace. And so going into the overtime, even without two of our starters, we were still in a place of confidence and we were still in a place of peace. Thank you, Coach. Okay, thank Best you very of luck much. tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. They didn't ask you a question, Micah. Be joined momentarily by the U University of North Carolina student athletes. Thank you. Joining us are Leaky Black, Caleb Love, R.J. Davis, Armando Baycott, and Brady Manick. Okay, we're going to start with questions. Let's go right there. Armando, David Teal, Richmond Times Dispatch. What has motivated you, even after the transfer to IMG, to remain close with Coach Hamlin and the Trinity community back in Richmond? Yeah, I mean, I can kind of attribute a lot of my success and just how my whole life shifted going to Trinity Episcopal School. I just learned so much from going there and just was fortunate to be in such a great environment like that. Go ahead. Greg Barnes in South Carolina. This is for Leakey and RJ. Uh, over the last nine games, you guys have held your opponents below 41% shooting. Uh, that's since the Pittsburgh game. Can you attribute anything to that specifically? You got it, bro. You got it. You got it, bro. You said the shooting? Shooting under 41%. Shooting under 41? You mean like as a team or? Or oh, holding team, so I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I think we all bought into the defensive mentality. You know, Leakey's able to go out there and lock down the best defender, and then we all tie into that. Um, I feel like we feed off his energy um, that he bring, what he brings to the table. And you? Leakey, 
got to finish that answer. Um, <laughs> Do you want to? No, nah, you're good. <laughs> this is C.L. Brown, Raleigh News and Observer. Um, this is for Brady, and if anybody else want to chime in. Um, Brady, what to you was the difference between once Dawson left and you knew you were going to have to play a whole lot of minutes um, and what you were doing when he was still on the team and, and you know, you were coming off the bench at one point and that kind of stuff because your scoring averages have gone up. Obviously, your minutes have had to go up. Yeah, I think I'm doing the same thing as I was before, just uh, getting more opportunity, playing longer, um, you know, uh, really stepping into that, that four-man role and uh, just been playing well, playing a lot more. And then, then the next person behind you. Ross, Mar <clears throat> Ross Martin, Inside Carolina. My question is for Armando. Uh, one of the big reasons you said you came back this season was to have the big games the big moments, the kind of experience. I was wondering if you felt like you've achieved that, accomplished that, and your emotions regarding that. Yeah, I mean, I would say overall this season has been a success just so far where we at and just specifically just these last few weeks just winning these big games and, I mean, the fans and everything, the school it just seems alive again and back to where it was kind of before my freshman year. And I feel like it's been a great experience and it's been good for all of us just to be able to be a part of it. Let's go to the back there. Uh, ben Balch, Los Angeles Times. For Brady, uh, they like to play with four guards a lot. Uh, do you see that as a stretch four, something that you look forward to seeing as a, a guard on you, and do you feel like that's something that plays to your advantage? Uh, I'd say uh, throughout the year I've, and throughout college, I've had uh, guys that I haven't guarded uh, guard me. Um, I've had small guys. I've had big guys. Um, you know, throughout, throughout the years, I've had more uh, – two threes match up on me if the team's got a couple bigs. So, yeah, definitely something that we've we've gone against this year and I've gone against in the past of having a guard-like player on me. It's for Xavier Jones, Tar Heel Illustrated. It's for Armando and Leakey. You guys almost played UCLA back in December, and I remember talking to you guys a couple days before that. You guys were pretty excited about the opportunity to play them. Now you finally get that opportunity. Uh, just kind of discuss the idea of playing a program like UCLA, not playing them in December, but getting them now. Um, I mean, I would say I'm very excited because I remember my freshman year, they kind of had a lot of the same guys. They added a few different pieces. I mean, it was an up-tempo game. And it was a lot of fun. And I mean, just UNC versus UCLA is two big-time programs. And just for us to be able to meet in the Sweet 16, especially with all the history we have, with that program, it's a great opportunity, and we know a lot of people will be watching too. Yeah, pretty much what he said. You know, um, two big time programs meeting in Sweet 16. You know, on the stage is it'll be a fun game. Terrence Hatchett, uh, Carolina Blitz, is for Leaky. Um, you were on that 2019 team that went to the Sweet 16. How have you used that experience to help the rest of the group? How that works. Um, you know, uh, it's been in tough moments. You know, trying to. Keep our guys poised, you know. Uh, like the game against Baylor, there was a couple. Um, the game against Baylor, there was a couple uh, moments where we were getting rattled, you know, just being in that position before, you know, just trying to get everyone to settle down, kind of thing, and just being a leader. Adam Zagori. Yeah, hey guys. Uh, for I guess Armando and RJ and anyone who wants to answer, uh, Adam Zagori, New York Times. You know, Huber coached in the NBA. He's one of a couple coaches in the tournament who, uh, or played in the NBA. I'm sorry couple coaches who played in the NBA, Penny Hardaway, Jawan Howard. How appealing is it to guys like you and recruits coming to the schools to be coached by a guy who played in the NBA? And any specific examples of, you know, stuff he does that, that can help you kind of pursue your future goals? Caleb, do you want to start us off? Or? Uh, well, I mean, it, it's just great, you know. Uh, he has that experience, and he's, he's been up there. Um, and so... Uh, just him having that experience and that knowledge uh, of the game, and you know, we just we listening to everything he tells us to do, and we go go as he goes. RJ, uh, <clears throat> like what Caleb said, you know, he's been in big moments. Um, you know, he has he has stories that he told us, and we just basically listen to him. Um, we like to pick his brain a lot, and just to you know, learn from him, and you know, because he's been in our position and he knows what we want to accomplish, you know, our dreams and goals. So just to be able to pick up, a, you know, what he teaches us is a, a great thing to have. Uh, I would say just 
for all recruits. I mean, I don't see why they wouldn't look at the way we play and kind of not want to go here and consider going here. I mean, we got Coach Solomon, too, who was in the NBA for 20 years, and then Coach Levo, too, who coached in the NBA. So a lot of the things we do, if that's defensively icing the ball screens, the offense kind of free-flowing, shooting a lot of threes, spacing the floor out, miss a lot of opportunities to show those type of things that NBA teams like. And, I mean, it's just great and fun to be able to do. And, yeah, we enjoy it. RJ, just to follow up real quick, is there any specific story he told you or something that stands out that really sticks with you about? Uh, just like, you know, he told us, you know, uh, when he's like in the NBA Finals, just those moments that he was in. Um, and, you know, playing with the New York Knicks, you know, I kind of feel like, you know, the, the way he plays with his passion, he carries that over into, you know, his pregame speeches, which gets us fired up. So I appreciate that. Chris, up front. Chris Murray from the Philadelphia Sunday Sun. Over the years, Carolina with Traditions of Dean Smith, Roy Williams have been a favorite in these tournaments. How is it that that you guys, especially when you guys beat Baylor, you guys, how do you like playing that under the underdog role? We don't normally see Carolina as the as as the underdog in the situation. I don't think we really pay attention to that. I don't think we really go into any game thinking that any team we play are better than us. So I guess that's just more for I guess y'all and the people to really see it as, but. I don't think we're going in the game thinking that like we the underdog or embracing a, like an underdog role or whatnot. Yeah. Taylor Vipolis inside Carolina. Uh, this is for RJ and Caleb. I was just curious, what do you guys like about each other's game if, from the perspective of the other when you guys watch each other out there on the court? Uh, we just play off of each other, you know. Uh, you know, I find I find him. He finds me. Uh, I know where he likes the ball on the court, and you know, I, I'm 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 always looking for him uh, when we're in transition, uh, when half court. I always know where he's at because you know he can shoot the cover off the ball, and uh, when he got a mismatch, he always hears me saying go at him. So like, if he got a big on big on, I'm like it's your world. So I, you know, I'm just playing off him. He he playing off me, and we we play together. Uh, we complement each other well. I know both of us can score the ball at a high level. Um, and, you know, what I like about his game is that, you know, he doesn't fear anyone. Uh, he'll take it at you. He's very confident. Uh, and I know when he's in that mode, and I tell him to keep going. And I think that's something that we both have in common. Uh, we both have confidence in each other, which is why uh, we can gel so together on the court. Go ahead. Trayvon Miles, ABC 11, Raleigh. Uh, this question is for Caleb and Brady, just specifically how last game ended for you. Uh, Hubert said in the presser earlier that you guys would play today. How anxious are you to uh, get back out there? Uh, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, it was it was kind of different to watch uh, from the bench um, and those games where you couldn't really do nothing uh, to get, get out there. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I am hyped to play this game and I am ready ready for the next game. So. Uh, you know, I'm just going to go out there and do, it, do what my teammates want me to do and uh, do whatever we got to do to get the win. We're going to yeah. take oh, – go. I'm sorry, guys. Sorry. I would say uh, I'm more excited just the, to, be, to be here. I've never made it this far. Um, this is uh, a new experience for me, and uh, I'm just going to enjoy it. I'm going to take one from Zoom, Daryl Johnson. Go ahead, Daryl, please. Let's go for, go right here while we get Daryl on. Uh, C.L. Brown, Raleigh News and Observer. Could each of you just go down the line one by one and tell me what you thought the turning point of this season was? What what game or what moment? Well, uh, for me, I think it was when um, the tough week after we played Miami and Wake Forest. You know, obviously it was a disappointing uh, week. Um, the next practice, Coach Davidson came in, you know, super positive. And we were not expecting that at all. You know, we expected him to come in hot and kind of chew us out kind of thing. But he was not. He was super positive, And I feel like that's, that was a turning point for us. Go. Same, same, same thing. Uh, Miami and Wake Forest, uh, we came back. So uh, when we got back, uh, you know, we just got right back to work. Uh, you know, it wasn't no uh, feeling sorry for ourselves. And we had a full season ahead of us. So we didn't get down on ourselves or nothing. We just got back to work, did what we had to do. And then I also think. Uh, when we beat Syracuse and we, we gutted that win out, um, I feel like that brought us together more. Um, and ever since then, we've just been on the roll. Let's take one from Zoom, Daryl Johnson. Go ahead, Daryl. Uh, 
Sorry about that. One, one last one over here. Um, this is really for anyone as well. Jordan Kramer, CBS 17. Um, Hubert Davis said he's kind of talked to you guys about not being tough, not being resilient, um, things along those lines. When he has those conversations with you, what's kind of going through your mind? Can you say that again? <laughs> Uh, Coach Davis said that he's challenged you all about not being tough enough, not being resilient enough throughout the season. When he does kind of have those challenges and have those conversations with you, what does that, you know, evoke in you all? Uh, me, I mean, I hear it, but I kind of think that's BS because, I mean, I know deep down that all of us, we got got that in us. And, I mean, it was just kind of some we had to just display all the time. And, I mean, I feel like we kind of been showing that as of recently. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Best of luck tomorrow. Reminder the record recording of the press conference is in the NCA Digital Media Hub. We will be back here at 205 with the UCLA players. <laughs> yeah, good seeing you too. I didn't see you over there. It's hard the light. No.
turn it on the camera if I throw it this way.
Okay. Yeah, so for me, I would say that's pretty, that's, that's too close for comfort. But Ford, 430, four, yeah, 480, four, yeah, sure. If I were you too, whatever you get, I would make sure it's digital because in order to be, um, the space is going to get more and more crowded. So that's why I recommend flexibility. Because no, they're equal. Either one. And then find the microphone that you most like. You can use any microphone with any of them. Yeah, I mean, I do have a microphone. Right, so here's the thing. You have two different systems. You have a short system, you have an electronic system, right? Take your favorite ultrasonic microphone, put it on the shore, and see if the sound quality is the same. Yeah, you can buy the adapters. The TAF4 and five that you can buy them. Just like two cents, so you can do what you want. No, 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 no. I'm saying no. Number one, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. 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 Like, for instance, like these here, you know, they're, you know, around a thousand bucks a channel, <laughs> you know, and everything is metal, <laughs> and I, I could throw it at you, knock it out, and it still works. You know, so it's all about, you know what I mean? It's like Ford. You can buy a Mustang. You can get a Pinto, right? Like, yeah, they're not the same. Right. <laughs> Alrighty. Thank you. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. Okay, great. Oh, okay, so players are ready to go. Yeah. All right, let me. Four names, right? Uh, yep. Okay.
That's it. Yeah. And I'll start my intro and then I'll come in at, uh, let me just do the intro and then you can guys come in. Afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, welcome to the Division I Men's Basketball Regional Semifinals of Philadelphia. We're going to start this session with UCLA student athletes. Just a few reminders. Please silence your cell phones. Please provide your name and media affiliation. We have microphone holders. Just raise your hand. They will get the microphone to you, and I'll, I'll call on you. Uh, recording video of these press conferences is prohibited on your cell phones. We ask you to use the NCA Digital Media Hub or the media boxes in the video workroom. You can still take, you can still take photos. And then we have the satellite coordinates for all the high definition feeds in the media workroom. If you have any issues finding those, please see one of us from the media coordination team. We are now welcomed by the student athletes from UCLA, Jules Bernard, <coughs> Johnny Juzang, Tyler Campbell, and Jaime Jaquez. Tiger, Tiger. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. I, you know what? I saw that. I'm sorry, Tiger. And we will start now with questions. We'll start down here, right, right away. Uh, ben Balch, Los Angeles Times. Uh, Jaime, just to get this out of the way, are you uh, practicing today and uh, expect to play tomorrow? And then have a follow-up after that. Yeah, I mean, I'm day to day, so uh, we, you guys will see at practice. Um, did some light stuff yesterday, but I'm just day to day right now. Okay. And then you guys have been through a lot of NSA tournament games together. Uh, is there a favorite part for you as far as, you know, something that you've come to look forward to the most, whether it could be anything, just going to meal with these guys or going to walk through or the game itself or the celebration? Is there something that's become like really special to you? I mean, I'm sure the whole thing is, but is there something in particular? Uh, I think just after film, going to Tiger's room uh, and, and playing Super Smash Bros and, and, and dunking my teammates. <laughs> that's probably what I look forward to. Yeah. Uh, for for Tiger, that's uh, Sam Connor with Sports Illustrated, all Bruins. Uh, first Tiger. Who's the best on the team at Super Smash Bros? Well, you know, everybody would have a different opinion. Uh, you know, some guys say me, some guys say Russ, some guys say Jaime. You know, I haven't heard anybody say Jules, really. You know. uh, some guys say Cody. But, uh, you know, me, personally, I'd say I'm the best player. Uh, I'm the best all-around Smash player on the team. Who, who's so, your go-to character? Who's you got my go-to? Yeah. I play with King K. Rule. Okay. And um, I use Ganondorf sometimes, so, but I mean, I'll go random and get some wins, so it doesn't really matter for me. Nice. And then, so you've talked before about how you kind of want to be a, a voice for coach out on the court, and obviously being the point guard, that translates pretty clearly on offense when you're, like, distributing the ball and everything. But on defense, do you kind of take on that role too, do you think, or is that more kind of everyone plays their equal part, do you think? Um, well, you know, coach is a great defensive coach. So uh, we all, uh, especially in this tournament, how we've been playing defense, we all have to come together and uh, play defense and lock in. So it's really not just one person that can do that. It's uh, everybody being on the same page and, you know, actually wanting to play defense out there and get stops. So that's what I say. Hey, guys, Chris Harry, CBS Los Angeles. Uh, this is for Johnny. You know, last year, getting to the Sweet 16, how is this year different in terms of you guys knowing what to expect, getting to the Final Four last year, and really having a lot of these guys back in the mix? Yeah, um, obviously we've got almost the same roster, but uh, I do think it's a, a different experience. You know, last year, obviously coming as an 11 seed, um, I guess just the dynamic of the games is a little bit different. This is like, okay, we need to be sharp and we need to play our best, handle business, right? And um, I, I would just say the pressures are a little bit different, right? You're, you're dealing with managed more pressure. You're the favorites a lot more games this year. 
Um, so just just staying sharp and and still, you know, even if you are a higher seed, um, you know, still being the hunter, playing like the hunter, and uh, coming out aggressive and, and trying to throw the first punch. Uh, Eamon Brennan from The Athletic. Uh, I'm wondering if you guys are reminded of yourselves a little bit when you see this Carolina team. It's a talented team that struggled early in the year, figured it out late, um, and is playing really well, coming in as a slightly higher seed in the tournament, and what it feels like to be a team like that that's figured things out down the stretch and feels like you're playing your best ball right now. Um, I would say there are definitely, definitely some similar qualities. They have a lot of talent. And uh, they play hard, and uh, you know, like like you said, they they're playing some of their best basketball um, later on in, in, in the year. Um, but you know, I feel like uh, you know we've we've uh, we've studied them a bit, quite a bit actually, since you know we were supposed to play them early on in the season, and we we couldn't play them unfortunately due to COVID. But they're a lot different team now, and we know that, and uh, they have. They, I feel like they've really bought into who they are as a team and and really uh, keying on uh, and on what they need to do to win games. And you know we've seen that over the past you know few weeks um, with them. And you know they're a great team. They're different from who they were before. And we're just prepared to uh, you know fight and claw and do whatever it takes to to bring out a win. That's Andrew Jones from Target Illustrated. Jules, to, to stay on that, you guys were supposed to play them earlier, and they are a lot different. What are some of the noticeable differences to you guys in them now from what you studied before? And also, is it kind of cool that you finally do get a chance to play them considering you were supposed to before? Yeah, um, I feel like, um, for one, you know, you could just tell that there there's a more assertiveness on, on both ends. You know, on the defensive end, they, they play hard. And then on the, on the offensive end, they I feel like they've kind of found their identity. You know, uh, they have a, a, some really great guards, um, and then obviously they have a shooter in Brady Manic, and then uh, an offensive force in the post um, with Baycott. So um, you know, I feel like they they understand who they are a little more now as as the season. You know, that comes with time and, and experience. So as the season has you know come along, I feel like they've sort of found that identity. And um, you know they're playing really well right now, and yeah, it'll be it'll be definitely fun to uh, finally get to play them, and play them at their best. So we we love a challenge, and and it's definitely going to be a challenge and, and a great game. So um, we're looking forward to it. Johnny, you talked about the togetherness on this team. What what does that feel like to you? Can you kind of unpeel that a little bit? What does that feel like the togetherness and and to be part of that? And what does that feel like to you? And what does that mean to this team to have that? Yeah, you can feel it. Just the support for 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 one another. You can feel it. Um, and honestly, how I think it's just on, gone to a little bit more. Not that we weren't together before, but to another level when it comes to that tournament time, right? You can feel all the touches, right? And the okay, talking about this, talking about that, whatever. Great job on this. Great job on this. Let's look for this. Let's look for that, right? You can just feel the cohesion come even tighter. I think so. I think it, you can feel it in a lot of ways, but. Um, it, 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 it's. I think, at this level, what you what you need to win. It's, it could be one of the you know biggest things is who is the most together because there's going to be trying times. Like every team, especially at this point, is great. So, it, it it's not a, a whether if there will be challenges. There will be challenges, and there will be right th those moments in the game where things aren't going your way. It's for certain. So. The team that's really, really together, you know, can 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 come out of that. So, uh, no, I think it's great. Uh, Jaime, you obviously uh, missed a game earlier in the season with a left ankle injury. I think you left the Stanford game earlier with a right ankle injury. You made the decision to go to braces. Can you just reflect a little bit on this journey with your ankles here? Um, and, and I imagine there's been some frustration that's gone along with that the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, like you said, it's been a journey, um, a long one. Uh, it's something that all players have to deal with when you get into this game. You know, especially at this time of year, you're not everyone's 100%. Um, everyone's battling through something. But yeah, it's been frustrating for sure. But I'd rather have, you know, injuries like this where something I can battle back from than something, you know, really devastating. Knock on wood that that doesn't happen. But, um, you know, it's just something that we have to persevere through, something I have to go through. And, you know, everyone has to go through something, um, you know, during the season. And this is what happened to me. So uh, we're, we're just fighting through it every day.
Cole Nowak, Philly Sports Digest. This can be a question for any four of you guys. After such a tough end of the season last year and the way the Gonzaga game ended, how was it a tough off season and how good do you guys feel as if you guys are in the Sweet 16 this year, having another chance to finish the job that you weren't able to finish last year? Tiger? Um, <clears throat> could you ask that one more time? After the way the season ended last year, I guess, how did you guys regroup over the summer and get yourselves, get yourselves ready to come and prepare this year? And now that you guys are in the Sweet 16, having another chance to finish the job, how do you guys feel as a team? And do you guys feel as if there's a difference from last year? Or do you feel as if maybe last year the breaks just didn't go your way, but you have the same, <coughs> you have the same camaraderie as you did last year? Well, you know, coming off the loss to Gonzaga last year, you know, we went into the summer. Uh, I'm not going to say that. We were sad after the loss. You know, we were really proud of uh, about what we had done all season. So it was easy to work this summer. Looking forward to get back uh, to this point now this year. But to say about this year, um, you know, it's a new year. It's cool to be compared to last year that we made it to the Final Four. But we got a couple of new players. You know, people are playing a little different. High mates coming off this stuff. So I just say we're just taking it one game at a time, just like last year. It's a one-game tournament. You know, we're not looking to the Elite Eight, the Final Four. We're looking at the Sweet 16. We're looking at North Carolina. We play them on Friday. So we're just really taking it one step at a time, trying to take it slow. Right here. Uh, Jaime, talking about your ankles and the, the injury and everything, obviously there's a lot of talk around this time of year about just kind of locking in, tuning out noise, focusing on the game. But at this point, you don't know if you're going to be playing Friday or not. Is that any more difficult to just kind of lock in and, and focus 100% on the game? Or do you do that, and then if you find out you're not playing, you're not playing? Yeah, I mean, I'm just looking at the game, watching the film, going to practice, doing the same old, same old. Uh, I'm not really, you know, worried about, you know, the outcome of tomorrow. I'm just kind of locking in, doing everything as I should, you know, um, preparation, you know, going to sleep at the right time, doing, doing all the things that I would do, um, you know, if I was 100%. So nothing really changes for me. Jules, there's a, a bigness to this game, right? UNC, UCLA, when you, you just think of the history of both of these programs, what does it mean to not only be in the Sweet 16, but to play in a game with th this bigness to it? I mean, as, as uh, competitors and players growing up, that type of environment um, is something that we, we all – look forward to. I mean, we watched, I'm, I'm sure all of us watched um, March Madness as a kid and, you know, we watched those huge games and, and buzzer beaters and huge matchups like you're talking about right now and just to be a part of it means something and it's, uh, it's special for us. It's, uh, it's something that we all dreamed about and, um, but other than that, we're really, we're really just excited to, to, you know, have an opportunity to move on and, and, and play play a great team. Um, we know we know their history. Um, we know how good they are, and um, we're just we're just super excited to play and, and get another opportunity to play the game that we love against a great team, against great players, against a, a great coach that they have over there. Um, so um, yes, the, the history is a, it's a lot of fun to talk about and think about. Um, but in terms of the game, we're just super excited to play. We're gonna take one from the Zoom. Room and a label. Go ahead, please. Hi, I'm Anna Lively with Sports Illustrated Kids, and I was just wondering, um, going off of your guys' most recent game, all of your starters from the second round game all scored between 28 to 38 points. How do you feel that consistency and team chemistry will help you against UNC? Johnny, you want to start with us for us, please? Um. Can you repeat the, the last part of the question? The, sorry. Um, sure, no problem. The last part was just how do you feel that consistency from that past game and team chemistry will help you against UNC? Oh, yeah, it's great. I mean, you get the ball rolling, the, the confidence going, and, um, you know, just a lot of cohesion, right? Just good momentum swing into the game. But look, it's a new game, different opponent, different scouting. So um, I, I think it's good for momentum, but um, otherwise, right, you got to strap back in, lock back in, and, and come ready to, to fight for the next game. Um, so, you know, just you still got to stay focused. But yeah, I mean, momentum, I, I think it helps a little bit. Do we have any more questions in here? One more, Chris. Chris 
Murray, Philadelphia Sunday Sun. Uh, Tiger, you talked about you want to be the coach's guy out there on the court. How much do you how much do you appreciate his approach to the game, and how much has it improved your game? Well, uh, just seeing how hard of a worker coach is and how he comes in every day, you know, ready to work, uh, it's inspiring to me, especially being the point guard and, you know, knowing that I have to lead through him on the court and what he tells me, I got to spread to the other guys. So it's just built our connection, just watching how hard he works, honestly. That's what it is for me. Uh, and um, our connection, you know, has been built over the past couple of years and um, it just keeps getting stronger and stronger. So, yeah. Final question, or do you have one down there? Last one, please. Yeah, Jaime, uh, did you see the uh, sign snafu on the uh, halftime show last week? And does that, aid, you, you said you like being the underdog, and when, you know, when they misspell your name on national TV, does that feed into that, and do you kind of uh, feed off that? Yeah, well, what were you talking about? The, uh, they misspelled your name on the, uh, they were doing a, a, can you pronounce this player's oh, name? Oh, with, 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 with Chuck, with Charles? Yeah. Yeah, I saw that, I saw that. Um, yeah, I know last year my sister had sent a video to him about how to pronounce my name, and he, he had shouted her out, but now I guess he's just got to spell it right. So we're almost there. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. Thanks. Best of luck thank tomorrow you. night. Thanks. We'll be joined by Coach Mick Cronin momentarily. Reminder, please state your name and your media affiliation. Thank you. Another reminder that the recording will be in the NCA Digital Media Hub at nca.veritone.com. Transcripts provided by ASAP will be available very soon after this press conference is finished. And we thank you for your cooperation. Sounds like we have a couple minute delay, so hopefully Coach will be joining us in a few minutes. Just the schedule for Saturday with regards to press conferences. <clears throat> the first one will be the winning coach and players from the second game 
and the, for tomorrow's second game, and that'll be at 2.50 p.m. to 3.30 p.m., followed by the winner from the St. Peters-Purdue game at 3.40 p.m. So 2.50 and 3.40 on Saturday for your in-between day press conferences. Coach, how are you? Right here. Right yep, next, right, right next to me. This is the practice day press conference for UCLA head coach Mick Cronin. Welcome to Philadelphia, Coach. You're welcome to make an opening statement, or we can just start with questions. Uh, it's great to be here. Got a cheesesteak today, so I'm happy. Terrific. <laughs> Perfect. All right, let's get the questions rolling down here. Austin Petalo, Turn the Philly Hoops. Two questions, Mick. One, where is the cheesesteak from? Uh, you, you know what? They catered it for lunch. It wasn't Del Sandro's. Okay. But it was good. Yeah. I don't know if they make a bad one here. No. It's kind of hard to find one that's bad. Right. And two, um, what's the update with Jaime? Is he practicing? Is he going to play? He's, we're going to try to have him do some stuff today. Um, obviously, I've been, you know, treating him with kid gloves all week. So hopefully he can get some things done. I think, you know, he's going to want to try to play. The question is, can he be effective? You know, playing is one thing. Can, can he play well? So I would know more, uh, as you guys know, our practice times here in about 30 minutes. So we'll, we'll see how he looks today. Do you think he can be effective? I haven't, he hasn't done anything all week, so I don't know. <laughs> I haven't let him do anything but shoot. So we'll see. C.L. Brown, Raleigh Group Observer. How you doing, Mick? Long time, man. <laughs> Long time. <laughs> um, I was curious. You guys were supposed to play Carolina back in December. If, yeah. If you guys already had scouting reports and everything prepared, I was I was just wondering what you what is the biggest difference between Carolina back then and what you've seen now. That's probably a good one for my uh, associate head coach Darren Savino because he was on them. We were preparing to play Alabama State, and I got COVID. I had the shakes, man. I, was on, I wasn't one of those asymptomatic dudes. <laughs> so um, he was preparing to coach the game, actually. They were, you know, but then everybody just started falling like dominoes for us. But he, I, you know, I think, look, I, I guess I'll just take it further for you. You know, it, Hubert's a great guy, one of the nicest guys I've ever met. But coach, you know, he's a coach. So Co coach Davis has done a tremendous job with him. You know, big change. Uh, big shoes to fill, obviously, um, tough. I, I did it at Cincinnati following Coach Huggins. Um, you know, he made a lot of changes to their offensive style of play. I think it just probably took them some time. You know, just when, when, when you're, you're changing, you know, the passing game, the secondary, and you go into a more modern NBA spread, pick and roll. Um, it probably just took them some time, some adjusting to find their stride, maybe Coach Davis as well. Um, but uh, obviously, uh, they're, they're playing extremely well right now. So it's a credit to the job that he's done and his talents. I think they obviously, they, they picked the right guy. Coach, how you doing? Chris Hayre, CBS Los Angeles. Hey. Um, you know, recognizing every game in the tournament is, is huge, but when you see and you say UCLA in North Carolina, it, it's got a different meaning. It's someone who just has it a great appreciation for the history of the game. Yeah. What is it like to, to play in a game of this magnitude in the tournament against a team like that? Yeah, just, you know, growing up um, in, in my household, you know, it was Dean Smith and Bob Knight, you know, from my dad who's a high school coach, you know, and having read all Coach Smith's books about, you know, I know all about the Carolina way. So, I, you know, I have great reverence for their, their, their program and, and the history of their program. So every now, you know, but again, every time I turn left, uh, on Sunset, 
you know, I pinch myself every day. I would tell Chill, I told, you know, I was fortunate enough to get a contract extension thanking Chancellor Block and Martin. And I tell Chancellor Block, you know, when I take that left every day, it's, it's hard to believe. Um, so, you know, it's just uh, obviously I think it's important the, the older you get to, uh, you know, be thankful for stuff like this, just to be a part of it. You know, I'm, uh, you know, I didn't grow up on third base. So for a guy like me to get here to the point where you're coaching, at UCLA, and then you're coaching in a game like this. It's 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 pretty cool, man. Uh, Eamon Brennan, the Athletic Head Coach. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about the differences in mentality and preparation where you guys are this year in the season you've had versus how you were in the tournament last year, and if you see some similarities in where you guys were in the tournament last year with this Carolina team playing really well, talented, but took a little while to figure things out. Um. Yeah. I mean. There could be, there, you know, when you're comparing them this year to us last year, um, because we weren't as deep as we are this year. Let's assume we're healthy. Um, you know, so they're, they're, you know, they don't play a lot. They they play their starters a big. You know, I heard uh, some of the people referring to their starters as the Iron Five. So we did a lot of that late in the year last year after Chris Smith and Jalen Hill um, went down for us. So I think there's a lot of similarities. You know, and they're playing really well right now. They're and they're confident. Um, you know, the, the, the newer coach, similar to our guys, so a lot, lot of similarities in, the, in that regard. Hopefully, that not, you know, they won't be similar if they make the final four. <laughs> Tark Patel from the LA Daily News, Coach um, Cody Riley and Miles Johnson. Um, their size, just how important that is in this game, and maybe it's not your take on that. Well, it's important every game, but I think you know you're 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 referring to Baco. You know, he's a. I think you know he, he to me Baco's a poster child for staying in school. You know, you get better. Guys just get better. You know, everybody's a McDonald's All American doesn't turn out in year one. And um, I don't care <clears throat> the you know the so-called geniuses that don't have him on the draft board, or in my opinion, they're missing out because everybody, whether it was Paul Millsap. Um, you know, or, or Montrez Harrell. A anybody that averages 11, 12, almost 13 rebounds makes it in the NBA. He'll make it, period. I, my respect for him is off the charts. Because he stayed in school and he's learned how to impose his physicality on a game for the entire game, that's, it, it makes them s such, I mean, he, he, he imposes physicality on Mark Williams. That's hard to do now. You know, Mark, Mark's a great player and another pro, so. Uh, our, our big guys are going to have – they got their hands full, man. <laughs> and we've been working on it all week. I mean, they got their hands full. It's hard, hard to simulate his, his, his presence around the rim on offense. And then, then he goes after every rebound. I mean, his, his, he's impressive. He, to me, he's like Montrez Harrell. He's, just, he's taller. Okay, we'll go in the back first and then come back up here. Uh, Mick, Pete Thamel from ESPN. Hey, uh, you had some kind of quips this week about Jaime's ankles, and you kind of said he couldn't sprain them anymore. Yeah, that's uh, true. <laughs> I, I'm just wondering, a player who's as tough as he is and kind of your emotional heartbeat, what it's been like to kind of watch him sort of go through this journey and dealing with this kind of stuff, and, and, and what's that, that's been like for him? Yeah, I mean, it's been a weird year. I mean, I had to watch Cody not play for two months. Um, you know, Jaime's, I'm going to say in the last two months, he was at, when he was able to start practicing, he was playing without practicing for a while um, just to get him back on the court. But then once he started practicing, Pete, he really, that's when he started dominating. He got his rhythm back. So uh, it, it's just, you, you know, for these kids, it, it, they, they worked their whole life to be on this stage. You know, we went through it last year and Jules Bernard got food poisoning the night before the Gonzaga game. You know, it's just, it, 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 and as a coach, if you're lucky enough, uh, you get other chances. These guys, they only get so many shots at this. So it's just, it's, it, it's obviously extremely unfortunate that Jaime's dealing with this. But I will tell you, if anybody can deal with it, it's him. He is the epitome of physical and mental toughness. Uh, ben Bulch, Los Angeles Times. What's up, Ben? Hey, um, I know you expect to be at UCLA a long time and do a lot of great things, but this team will always be the first th that went to the Final Four with you. How special does this team to you and all these guys who came back to try to do it again? Oh, extremely. It's a great question because, 
you know, like my message to those guys is we'll have a meeting tonight. Um, you know, everybody knows, obviously, it's win or go home. Um, you know, but for me, uh, you know, again, if you're fortunate uh, to coach at UCLA, uh, you know, with, with uh, just be fortunate to coach out my new contract. Um, but I'm not going to get to coach Jules Bernard again. You know, so I'm uh, I'm the type of guy I'm, I'm well aware of. Um, I'm very cognizant, and well aware of you are where you are because of the people that helped you, and it starts with the players. So. You know, there, there was, as you know, covering us, there was not a mass exodus when I got the job. You know, now there's a mass exodus, even though it's the same coach. <laughs> you know, but now, now um, could you imagine if, if, if the portal take a job now? Uh, you know, by the time you get on the plane to go to, to your press conference, half the team's probably in the portal. You know, no, we had nobody in the portal. Um, and, you know, they all... They all uh, embraced us as, a, as new coaching staff, and we got to work on rebuilding UCLA basketball to, you know, amongst the nation's best programs. And we would not have done that if they wouldn't have stayed. So obviously, in particular, the three seniors. But we got some guys who could go, you know, could get drafted. So we could lose more than three. So I'm very, very cognizant of the fact that this could be our last ride together as, as a group. So it's been awesome, though. So hope we, hope, hope we get a. 10 or 11 more days left in us, so. Go ahead, Chris, and then uh, we'll go back. Yeah, Chris Murray, Philadelphia Sunday Sun. I heard Shaheen Holloway uh, say earlier in the day that he likes to, to have kids who, are, who have a chip on their shoulder, who maybe not the most recruited guy in the world. Is that the same? And looking at how this UCLA team developed in yeah. the last year when going to the Final Four, is that what you, what you ideally would like for a team? I think it, it, it helps, um, I think, Young people, I mean, we could go on for a while about this, but I'll try to be quick. Um, it's, it's a burden when you're ranked high to live up to, your, to the hype. To me, it helps you if you're underrated because you have your hunger and your ambition instead of having it given to you or theoretically given it to you by somebody, some, some guy in a basement that ranks you seventh in the country. <laughs> you know, so what happens, you know, what Shaw would tell you is because, you know, what he's done, by the way, is unbelievable. I love him, man. We're friends. So, um, y you know, where he comes from, you know, it's a miracle, Shaheen Holloway's story. You know, they need to do, a whole, you know, where he comes from, what he's accomplished in his career and his life in St. Peter's is the greatest story to me. And if you've been there and you know him from high school, so he's going to say that. I'm the same way. My life wasn't near as tough, but, you know, like I said, I, you know, I'm a son of a high school coach from Cincinnati, man. You know, so um, I think we, we probably lean towards guys like that. But I think it also, you know, it's, it's hard, it's hard uh, for young kids that are rated high this day and age. They, you know, in our, in our game, kids start getting told they're a pro in ninth grade. They haven't accomplished anything. It's tough for those guys. I feel for those guys. It's easier for the underrated guy because he stays hungry. There's one in the back first. Uh, Cole Nowak, Philly Sports Digest. Hey, Coach. As you said previously, um, just a few minutes ago, sometimes you have to pinch yourself when you're taking a left. And as you come and you play UNC, two blue bloods who have so much history in college basketball, how is it, is it hard to manage the team's emotions and kind of keep them in check throughout the week? And how do you prepare them to play 40 full minutes of basketball and get to the Elite Eight? Yeah, I think, you know, our experience, the, we, we having been through the tournament last year is a factor. <clears throat> We're just focused on North Carolina. You know, we, we, you know, we know we have to beat – these guys know they have to beat Carolina or we're going home, man, and it's all over. So, um, I say we, we – the time change, we left Tuesday just to get, get out of L.A., get away from everybody telling us how great we are. That's a concern of mine. You know, I think it helped us being in the bubble last year. You know, so everybody, you stay, it's a lot easier to stay hungry when everybody's not telling you how great you are. So I, we tried to get the heck out of town before, as fast as I could, you know, so uh, get these guys back in our little bubble. But uh, the, our guys know, like, they, they get it. It's, you know, for you guys, the blue blood thing and all that, for them, they know they got to play well. I mean, we play good teams all the time, so. 
but you know, these guys are playing a lot of big games, so they 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 get it. I mean, if if we were playing St. Peter's, it'd be the same way. Got to win, or we're going home. Hey, Coach Sam Connor, Sports Illustrated, all Bruins. Man. How's it going? Uh, so uh, Manic, uh, obviously talented stretch four. How do you anticipate? Uh, what he's going to do and how you defend him, and do you kind of have to drop multiple defensive game plans when you don't know if Jaime is going to be able to be out there yes. or not? Yeah, you have to. Yeah, you know, Jaime's going to try, guys. I can tell you, unless something goes bad today, I would think he's going to try. The question is, can he be effective? But um, you know, more pointedly with Manic, he I mean, he just kills your defense because he he can catch if it, the way he's been shooting it, the confidence he's been playing with. Uh, he just stretches you to death. And it makes them like a pro team offensively. You know, like pro guys always, my pro friends will say, well, you guys don't know how to space the floor in college the way, you know, when you talk to them. And I said, no, 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 we know how to space the floor. We just all don't shoot it the way the pro teams shoot. <laughs> you know, it's easy. It, it, you know, all their stuff works because you got guys like, you know, Bogdanovich or Manic standing there at 6'10", and he can catch it and let it fly in a half a second. So you, you, so anybody can space the floor, but you're not going to stretch my defense. He stretches your defense. You know that's the problem. Which now you got Baco rolling, you got R.J. And, and Caleb Love driving. So you know he, he he the role he's on is a big problem because he stretches your defense. Um, when you, then what happens is you start giving up the three and the layup, and you can't give up both. You know, so you got to take something away. You start trying to take everything away, then then you start giving up everything. Okay, we have time for one more right there. Thank you. Hi, Ty Dobbert from City of Basketball Love in Philly. Um, you mentioned before kind of the bubble situation last year. It helps you maybe keep a little more focused. But also making a run to the Sweet 16 this year with a little more of that traditional excitement, the crowds back in the stadiums. What's it been like for you guys? Well, I think it's great for the guys. Again, you know, uh, they had no idea what was going on. Um, we came in to, to, to go to Portland, and Peyton Watson had, like, he had more luggage than a guy going on a trip around the world. I said, what are you doing? He goes, well, coach, we're going to win. He goes, we ain't going to be back for three weeks. <laughs> I said, no, my man. We're, we're, you know, we, we went to in Portland. We're coming home. <laughs> You know, he was, you know, but he knew last year, because, you know, last year I'm FaceTiming him from Portland the whole time, or from Indy the whole time, you know, while he was back in Long Beach. So, you know, he didn't know. You know, he, he didn't know. So it's, uh, that's a funny one for you. But the, anyway, no, it's, it's great for the guys. And all, all these kids in college. Again, you know, one thing that the re, uh, Coach Krzyzewski said that I remember um, retirement-wise, he, he said the older you get, the more you can make it about the kids. Make, make everything you do about the players, the, your job gets easier. The, the pressure goes away a little bit, you know, because it isn't about you and keeping your job. You know, you're trying to help them win so they can chase their dreams. So this is great for them, you know, because last year was obviously, uh, it was a great run for us, but, you know, there's 1,500 people at games. It was a little unusual, to say the least. Thank you, Coach. All right, guys, thank Best you. Best of luck tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes today's press conferences. Thank you for attending. Remember that ASAP will provide the transcripts and recordings will be available in the NCA Digital Media Hub at nca.veritone.com. Thank you again. We'll see you tomorrow.